I'll read it. Go ahead, I'll read it. Please start, Jack. No, you introduce me. Okay. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, once again to World Leader Summit uh, special edition for Future of Medicine. As you saw that we had approximate 137 speakers from various different countries, approximate 95 countries as of now till date. But now tonight in Indian time tonight and morning in probably a couple of other places, mainly in US and I can see someone joined from China as well. We will be having an amazing discussion and panel with all the doctors and scientists and change makers across the world. And this entire summit will be hosted by Jack We'll be doing it for next four hours. Stay tuned with us and enlighten us with your knowledge and wisdom. Over to you, Jack. Thank you. Good day to you, Arijit. And it's good to see you, Scott Tips and Dr. Miranda, dear Michael Gonzalez, uh, founder of the Future of Medicine Foundation, as, as is Scott Tips, and a dear friend, uh, Jin Yang Nick Zahn. Um, and everybody seems to be gathering now. Here we go. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Creation, and I'm the chairman and CEO of the Future of Medicine Foundation. I'm also the executive director of fundraising and marketing for the National Health Federation and the Foundation for Health uh, of Health Research. Okay. The entire two days of 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 uh, uh, the conference and the doctors' forum beginning yesterday is a uh, is in memory of Dr. Richard. Cunyan. Uh, he is the father, the co-founder and the father of orthomolecular medicine, which is nutrition-based medicine, and his association with Linus Pauling, who is a two-time uh, Nobel Prize winner. We're dealing with the world's leaders and their uh, legacy for delivering uh, health to humanity. And in this period of time in our history, we need nutrition to return health to humanity. We're, as you can tell by COVID and its impacts on our families and our uh, extended families and people around the world dying from a flu, okay? So you're gonna learn a little bit about that and why that's happening and how to prevent it. It's so easy to prevent, it's kind of mind boggling that anybody's died at all except for the most complex uh, cases of uh, people with illnesses in the in degenerative illnesses and deep stages of uh, close to death. So you get COVID even with intravenous vitamin C or with nutrition, which is really the basic tools you need to cure COVID from defeating you and or spreading in your family, literally. So you, you will learn these things today. The interesting thing about Dr. Cunyan is when he became a member of the foundation, uh, the Future Medicine Foundation, he wrote a really beautiful letter to us. We are dealing at a period of time in history where the number one agency in the world to return our, our, our ability to return health to humanity and, 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 and in fact uh, has been around since 1955, the National Health Federation, I'm in the process of, of working closely with Scott Tips, the president of the foundation is actually uh, in our audience right now. Uh, so I wanna give you a little background into the National Health Federation. It's the only agency on the face of the earth that works to protect your freedom, your rights to nutrition and your uh, rights to health. And, they, and Scott spent, part of today at the Codex Almentarius Commission of the United Nations, protecting us in, in, uh, through, through being present and lobbying and voting and doing what he's permitted to do. He's a one of a kind in the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, I might, we might alter this meeting a little bit today, Mike Gonzalez, and get Scott to give us a little deeper background into NHF uh, for probably about 10 minutes, if you can do that, Scott. But I wanna share this thoughts with you, my audience. Uh, NHF, the National Health Federation, is the most powerful, most influ influential advocate of health and health freedom that directly affects 7 billion people around the world. It is the world's oldest and most respected consumer health freedom organization. 
NHF is the only international non-government organization organize, recognized to speak, submit scientific research, and actively shape global policy at the international meetings of Codex Almentarius Commission. The Commission, Codex, is the global seat of power established by the United Nations that sets international standards. Now hear this. This is where you are, where you are being defeated as uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people that make up the greatest population here. If you're not doctors, you're, you're, you rely on doctors to, to give you what you need to survive and heal through a chaos of uh, say, say COVID or even degenerative diseases and corporations that want to deliver toxins into every aspect of our life uh, from agricultural to our water to you name it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Codex sets the international standards, guidelines and codes uh, of practice for agriculture, food, beverages, and nutritional supplements. NHF Scott, President Scott Huck Tips, who's sitting right here with us, is an attorney and has attended more Codex meetings worldwide as chief delegate of NHF than any other health freedom activist uh, combined on earth. Okay. Today, uh, in memory of Richard Cunyon and yesterday, uh, I want to give you a little background on Richard. Richard is uh, a founding member of the Future of Medicine Foundation, as is Scott Tips. But at the end of the day, Richard uh, joined on February 9th of this past year, and his legacy of delivering the, uh, of the Future of Medicine in over 60 years ago uh, um, literally lays down the foundation for orthomolecular medicine, the society, the International Society of Orthomolecular Medicine. And um, he's, he's also been directly involved with the National Health Federation as its vice president and a board of governors leader. Uh, uh, I believe, uh, Scott, was he a co-chairman? Was he a vice chairman? I think he was vice chairman at one time, yes. Yeah. And his son has now replaced him. I think so. Doctor, yeah, Dr. Cunyan died on February 23rd, just about a week and a half after becoming involved with the uh, foundation. So his legacy was continued there. And when you think about the lives and the, the idea of de delivering the foundations of nutrition-based medicine and, the, and the, the, the serious impacts that has on delivering and returning health to each and every one of you uh, listening and the people that will hear this in the future, I'm going to give you his last words in relationship to establishing the foundation. Excerpts from Dr. Cunyan's acceptance letter to join the Future of Medicine Foundation. It is my sincere hope our collaboration will lead to a greater international awareness among the general public business leaders and the global medical community to join forces and work together with the foundation to generate the economic resources required to continue research and the latest clinical trials the foundation has brought to my attention in the field of orthomolecular medicine, nutrition-based medicine. And the equal importance I'm very proud to join with you and the prestigious Future of Medicine Foundation medical team and business leaders you have brought together to advance global recognition, acceptance, and advocacy within consumer markets for disease prevention and life-saving attributes of nutrition-based medicine, integrative medicine, functional medicine. And the premier global institutions, the premier global institutions that work to prevent prevention and life-saving attributes to protect our rights to nutrition and nutrition-based medicine, the National Health Federation, the Foundation for Health Research. Once, establishing, once established as global respected brands, the National Health Federation, ISOM, and others like-minded institutions in league with the Future of Medicine Foundation and the members of its medical team and its business leaders will successfully serve as sustainability to merge nutrition-based medicine more fully into mainstream medicine. This will undoubtedly lead to market improvement in the world health and restoration of health to humanity. So we are dealing at a time when medicine has let us down. Our, even our governments in many countries have let us down. 
to protect us from COVID, okay? On the, 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 the first speaker we're gonna have today is Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez is a founder of the, found, uh, of the Future of Medicine Foundation. And try to appreciate this, the Future of Medicine Foundation is now focused and completely dedicated to taking the National Health Federation, delivering its brand to a globe of humanity, and our entire focus of fundraising is to advance NHF's ability to fight for our rights in global markets around the world, including the United States, where, it's, where it was initiated and established, okay? So everybody listening to this, if you want to appreciate the values of our National Health Federation and the United Nations and its Codex Almentarius Commission, uh, I recommend you become members of the National Health Federation. Uh, let's see what we have here. How to do this? Can you share? Can you share the uh, uh, the? Uh, there it is. No. Can you share the? Um, uh, where is that Egypt? I'm here. There you are. Can you share the, uh, or maybe I can do it. Let me see. I can't pull up the share button, so. What do you want? I wanted, oh, here it is. Hold on. Okay. You I can't, I want to put the NHF, the NHF document. Yeah. You know, the NHF. Don't, don't yeah, do it to yourself. I'll do it. Okay, thank you, my friend. How to get back. It's already shared, Jack. Beautiful, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about the only agency on earth that fights for your right to health, health freedom, nutrition in agriculture, supplementation and food, and the war that we're in right now and how many lives we've lost and all the good work of this agency, we're inviting you to become a member of the agency. You can see there is the link, www.thenhf.com and to become members and consider donations. Uh, we are going to establish a much broader base of global involvement due to the pandemic. Uh, and, without, and we need your help to do that. Thank you, Arijit. Hi, Greg. Aloha, Jack. Yeah, nice to see you, buddy. Okay, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, Michael. Yes, sir. Hey, Mike. I don't know, did we lose you? <laughs> no, I'm here, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We, I thought we'd see you, but it's okay. Uh, it's uh, Michael Gonzalez is going to his, his, his topic is going to be quite interesting because he's going to deliver the very foundations uh, of the evolution and of, of, of orthomolecular medicine, nutrition based medicine. And Dr. Greg Cunyan's uh, son is here, uh, excuse me, Dr. Richard Cunyan's son is here, Greg Cunyan, and he's going to be working uh, just right after uh, and working with Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, uh, to really share a real deep insight into what the future holds, how it how we got to nutrition-based medicine, and what it means to each and every one of you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Michael, you can begin. Hi, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to the different parts of the world. Uh, this is a real honor for me to be part of this initiative. And uh, I don't know if Arjit could uh, start out or uh, the presentation. Can you guys see it? You can oh, always got, start your presentation, Michael. It will show. He's but got. You've got the. You've got the National Health Federation uh, membership. Uh, Michael, your camera is off. I know, but uh, what I'm what I what I want to uh, show is the presentation. Can you guys see the presentation? No, your screen is not shared. Okay, let me go back then. Okay, let me. Okay, let me see if I could uh, share the screen here. Now, can you guys see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
So it's a, as I, I was mentioning earlier, it's a real honor for me to be part of this initiative and to represent my mentors and the founders, the real uh, brilliant scientists and, and physicians that started out this, this great idea. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what orthomolecular medicine is and a little bit about its story and how this uh, has really uh, evolved into a concept of nutritional-based medicine. I have here Dr. Albert San Giorgio, a Nobel Prize winner, the discoverer of vitamin C. And he has a saying that says that discovery is seeing what everybody else has seen, but thinking what nobody else has thought. I think that describes the mentality of all orthomolecular medicine uh, practitioners, thinking out of the box. And I think that's very important. In terms of health, you know that health it's defined as a complete state of physical, mental, social well-being, not merely the absence of, of disease. And I think that principle of balance, homeostasis, order, organization, compartmentalization, and communication, which is basically uh, dependent on energy, it's a concept that's very well in trial in the biochemic in the biochemistry principles that brought in orthomolecular medicine. Orthomolecular medicine is the right molecule at the right time in the right form. So it's a precursor of friendly or uh, physiologically uh, friendly molecules that are capable of correcting metabolism to achieve the necessary balance. And it's, it's a nutritional based medical approach. And we have to thank for this, uh, Dr. Richard Kunin, who brought this, who, who really translated this biochemical idea of balance into a nutritional based medicine together with Dr. Hugh Reardon and Dr. Abraham Hoffer. This uh, biochemical or chemical idea that was brought in by the two time Nobel Prize, Dr. Linus Pauling. And very long time ago, Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And we should go back to that. The idea here with orthomolecular medicine is that all diseases uh, are associated with specific biochemical abnormalities, which can be causal or contributing factors to the illness. And orthomolecular medicine concentrates in balancing these biochemical derangements with nutrients, precursor molecules, and somatical factors, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the founders, the real thinkers, the out-of-the-box thinkers, uh, Dr. Linus Pauling, the two-time Nobel Prize winner who published a very important paper in 1968 with this idea, which he called orthomolecular psychiatry originally, then it became orthomolecular nutrition and, and then eventually orthomolecular medicine. And he was helped by Dr. Abraham Hoffer, a uh, physician and scientist from Canada who, who worked a lot with schizophrenia, vitamin B6 and vitamin C. And, the, and then Dr. Richard Cunning, which I, I should have corrected the name here, but uh, with the Richard Cunning, it's very, very important because he started out the first society of orthomolecular medicine. So he was the physician who brought this idea of this biochemical medicine into a nutritional based medicine. So everybody could understand it and utilize it. He was also helped by Dr. Michael Lesser and eventually by Dr. Hugh Reardon. So these are the real uh, thinkers. And here we have uh, Dr. Linus Pauling. We could start, we could be an hour talking about Dr. Linus Pauling and all his, his great uh, things that he did in, 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 in science. But basically he was the originator of the concept of molecular disease. So based on his, all his knowledge of chemistry, biochemistry, he proposed that medical problems can be successfully treated, correcting imbalances and deficiencies of, of, with biochemical constituents that are normal for our body, which that, what he meant was with nutritional factors. Uh, he was also helped us, uh, Dr. Abraham Hoffer, as I mentioned earlier, which actually the, name, the original name was megavitamin therapy. But it was more than just vitamins. So in that sense, uh, that's why the name late, later was changed. And Dr. Hoffer was involved in many studies with LSD, niacin, uh, high cholesterol, schizophrenia, and all those things. And he was the first editor of the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine. And here's Dr. Richard Cunion, that uh, was the, a nutrition-oriented physician who started, who, who embraced this idea of nutritional-based medicine and made it available for the general public. 
he stated that we should use naturally occurring substances, particularly nutrients in maintaining health and treating disease. It's a new medicine based on non-toxic, non-invasive natural medicines that really it's rediscovering the knowledge of natural foods. And then Dr. Hugh Reardon, who was uh, a mentor for me and, and Dr. Miranda, who's gonna talk later today, uh, he was an American psychiatrist and researcher. He was the person who probably uh, worked more with uh, IV vitamin C and different diseases, degenerative diseases like cancer and infectious diseases. He had the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning, which is now uh, known as the Riordan Clinic. In terms of evolution of orthomolecular medicine, this uh, biochemical, physiological, functional approach to health, which is uh, based on, 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 on nutrition, it's uh, the use of nutritional supplement as therapy. It was called once megavitamin therapy, orthomolecular psychiatry, orthomolecular nutrition, orthomolecular medicine. Uh, later on, uh, we translated this to metabolic correction uh, and then functional medicine. So all these names are related to a certain extent to this idea of Linus Pauling that was further uh, worked by Dr. Richard Kunin. Uh, the hist uh, a very important story of orthomolecular medicine, it's vitamin C, a very important uh, uh, vitamin in, in general with so many uh, physiological and biochemical functions. And it, it was first brought to the attention of Dr. Linus Pauling by Dr. Irwin Stone which uh, rem I remember that Dr. Pauling used to say that he was not feeling too well. And Dr. Erwin Stone suggested that he should take uh, larger doses of vitamin C because he said that everybody had a subclinical sc scurvy deficiency of vitamin C. Later on came Dr. Frederick Klanner which used vitamin C in all sorts of diseases. And actually he cured all polio that went to his office with high doses of vitamin C. And he, I remember he's saying that if, if vitamin C has not worked for you, it's not, you're not using enough of it. So he used it in all sorts of diseases. Uh, then Dr. Anos Pauling came with this very important paper that I mentioned to you in 1968 called uh, uh, Orthomolecular Psychiatry. And he really, he, he had an application of quantum mechanics to chemistry. So he was a very knowledgeable guy in very different areas of, of chemistry, uh, science in general. And together with Dr. Abraham Hoffer and Dr. Richard Conan founded orthomolecular medicine, which is the nutritional based medicine that we're trying to uh, reinstate. And in terms of history of vitamin C, it's, it's, it's very long, but it's very important to know that in 1954, Dr. McCormick hypothesized that cancer was due to a vitamin C deficiency. In the 59, Dr. Burns uh, found that uh, we are susceptible to scurvy because we're lacking in an enzyme, which is golunolactone oxidase. In the 70s to 80 came Dr. Robert Kafka with his idea of bowel tolerance dose. It's basically that uh, we utilize vitamin C as the body needs it. So when you're in a disease state, it's too much uh, physiological stress. So you're going to need higher doses of vitamin C. So you will support, you will tolerate more vitamin C uh, than normally if you're not sick. So that's a very important concept of utilization of vitamin C by the body, which has not been really understood much in medicine, but he described this in, in, in that decade of the 70s and 80s. Uh, another very important names should be Dr. Steve Hickey, which in the, 80s, in the 80s, he proposed a model of dynamic flow, which is the uh, constant intake of ascorbate to maintain certain high levels in blood, which are very important in order to have to take advantage of all the different uh, mechanisms that vitamin C have in terms of degenerative disease or of infectious disease. Also in the 70s was Dr. Erwin Cameron. This was the first uh, clinical trial using vitamin C in cancer patients. He la later teamed up with uh, Dr. Linus Pauling to raise the awareness of vitamin C in cancer. And in the 90s, Dr. Hoffer also used uh, this uh, vitamin C and high doses to the treatment of schizophrenia, cancer, and other diseases. Then later on came Dr. Uh, Reardon, uh, who was the person that probably used more IV vitamin C. And uh, we have published a lot of papers that we published uh, in terms of IV vitamin C with Dr. Reardon when we were collaborating with him. Another important name is Dr. Mark Levine of the National Institute of Health. 
which has done some pharmacokinetic and ascorbate and has seen that ascorbate in high doses concentrations can selectively kill cancer cells. Uh, he published this in 2005, and he has a series of, uh, of cancer patients treated with IV vitamin C. So he, he came up, uh, he's a very, uh, I would say, uh, valiant man in terms of, 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 of presenting this information uh, coming from the NIH. Uh, then the history of vitamin C has other important names. It's, doc, it's Dr. Neil Reardon, who is the son of Dr. Hugh Reardon, Dr. Joseph Kashari, Dr. Miki Roa, who worked at the Center for Improvement of Human Functioning. The actual CEO is Dr. Huntinghacke, who has worked a lot with vitamin C. Dr. Levy, another member of, of the orthomolecular, these are most of the members of the orthomolecular uh, hall of fame. Dr. Uh, Cheng, uh, Dr. Huntinghacke, as I mentioned, Dr. Hickey, uh, it's me and Dr. Miranda who's going to be talking later on. So we have all worked uh, with vitamin C and seen how it can selectively kill cancer cells. And we published the most comprehensive review on cancer and vitamin C in 25 years. And it's also it's pretty safe to take. Uh, there's many applications of vitamin C. It's a very versatile metabolic factor. It, 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 as we know, it, it, it could cure scurvy as Frederick Klenner showed, poliomyelitis, uh, also infections and poisons by, reported by Klenner and Cathcart. Heart disease has been published by Linus Pauling and Matthias Rass, and cancer by Dr. Pauling, Cameron, Hoffer, Reardon, Levine, Gonzalez, and Miranda. Also, vitamin C is a very potent antiviral, and we think it, it could have saved a lot of lives it had been, if these people uh, had been treated early, you know, early treatment, uh, of, of COVID-19, I think we, should, we could have saved a lot of lives. Dr. Peng, uh, the, per the first person that you see in the photo, uh, was really instructed by Dr. Cheng uh, and when Wuhan, China, and they save a lot of lives using high dose IV vitamin C in COVID patients. We also, there it's Andrew Saul, who has been very vocal in terms of IV vitamin C as uh, a therapeutic uh, alternative, or not really alternative, but a therapeutic uh, tool that has not been used as, as it should be used. And it's me, we have published certain cases and we have published some literature and on, on all the possible antiviral uh, mechanisms of IV vitamin C. There's a, um, a doctor from Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, I forgot his name, Jorge, what's his name? Marcial Vega. Oh, Dr. Marcial Vega, I'm sorry that I forgot him, but he's a very uh, active person utilizing IV vitamin C in many conditions, and he has used it also in, in, in COVID. And Dr. that's Dr. Miranda, who's going to be talking later on today, who has been uh, a very, he's a very brilliant guy, a very valuable collaborator, uh, more than, not just a friend, he's a brother, really, in, in this issue. He's also a member of the Orthomolecular Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm very honored for him to be my brother. <laughs> And there's Dr. Uh, Ron Huntinghacke, who has been very important, Dr. Thomas Levy, Dr. Paul Merrick, who was the first to use IV vitamin C in sepsis, and Dr. Uh, Jorge, what's the name of the last doctor? Alpha Fowler, Dr. Fowler, who has also been using IV vitamin C in sepsis. So all these people have had experience in utilizing the antiviral effects of IV vitamin C. And what... Uh, Jack was saying it's, and Jorge was gonna, gonna be more on detail on this, is that nearly all men die of their medicines, not of their diseases. And there's uh, some information that the fourth cause of this is drug-related iatrogenia. It's, it's medications given to patients suffering different disease. And sometimes it's needed, sometimes it may not be needed, but if we could use some other source of help for these patients that will reduce this, uh, Morbidity and mortality would be a good idea. That's how this nutritional-based medicine can really help. There's many serious adverse events. Maybe uh, Dr. Dr. Miranda will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, also, it's 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 costly. It, it has a lot of costs and related to mor morbidity and mortality. So it goes in billions of dollars that could be probably safe if we use this nutritional-based medicine in the first place. I think Greg Coonan is going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the cost goes on and on, and it's getting up every year. Uh, the details will probably be given by Dr. Miranda. And uh, the thing with here is that we want to, to do 
some sort of medicine that is not as toxic as that. We want orthomolecular medicine can improve this morbidity and mortality. So we should use orthomolecular medicine. We should use nutritional based medicines as our first pick of our first tool against all diseases. And there's an old naturopathic principle, primum non nocere, first do no harm. And orthomolecular medicine has so much achievements in cardiovascular disease uh, by reducing homocysteine, reducing with vitamin B12, B6, folic acid, reducing cholesterol with niacin, in diabetes, uh, regulating glucose insulin with chromium, vanadium, B-complex, lipoic acid, in schizophrenia, reducing adenochrome with niacin, ascorbic acid, and zinc. Also, tromolecular medicine uh, has other achievements in arthritis with uh, reducing cartilage degeneration with glucosamine sulfate, collagen, aging you know, with antioxidant, reducing free radicals. In terms of cancer with non-toxic therapies as vitamin C and mitochondrial enhancers, and drug yatrogenia, you know, reducing the damage of statins, statins with CoQ10. And there's many more. And the idea here is that orthomolecular medicine should be the first option in current medical treatment because this metabolic correction of chronic disease produced by this nutritional-based medicine may take longer to produce results because it goes to the root of the disease. It's less toxic and it's more cost-effective. The benefits, everybody benefits from orthomolecular uh, nutritional based medicine, everyone. The individuals, because they improve the quality of their life, they increase productivity. The industry, because medical treatment will be more cost effective and less uh, adverse reactions. The professional, because there's more therapeutic success, less complications, less litigation for medical malpractice. And society, because it becomes healthier and more productive. And this is my last slide. There's one thing stronger than all armies in the world. And that's an idea whose time has come. And I think this, the time has come for nutritional based medicine, thanks to Dr. Pauling, Hoffer, Riordan, and Dr. Kooning. And, and I'm honored to have uh, following me Dr. Greg, uh, Dr. Greg Kooning, the son of, of Richard Kooning, and then later Dr. Miranda. And there's other very valuable uh, present, presenters that are going to follow. This, uh, this first presentation. I'm honored to be here. Thanks to Jack, thanks to Scott. And that's it. That's all folks. Like uh... <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, Michael. Uh, quite a history of the birth of orthomolecular medicine into nutrition-based medicine. And the real focus on vitamin C is really interesting. What most hit me about your speech was the fact that on our board of advisors are the doctors out of Wuhan, Dr. Pong. Si Yong Pong. Of course, we work very closely with Dr. Chang, uh, also out of China. And uh, Dr. Pong is the first uh, in very early 2020, in February 14th, I believe, uh, when COVID was just coming out. Uh, they caught it in China. And I'd like to make a statement here. Uh, anybody that's blaming China for COVID, stop doing it. COVID is a, came out of, this, out of the United States of America. It was brought to China and I lived there 24 years, 25 years, uh, 35 years working with the Chinese. And uh, at the end of the day, um, the function of bringing China up the snuff, <coughs> the number two economy uh, and what you've experienced recently uh, with uh, uh, how, how China's being attacked for COVID is, is not correct. Uh, America gave China uh, Wuhan, that laboratory in the hospital, Wuhan University and that laboratory uh, COVID. And they didn't know really what they were receiving. And then they, when they started to find out what they were receiving, they kept getting funding and what have you. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a complex situation there. But what the Chinese did after a horror of dealing with a lot of death, okay, is they grabbed the function of what they learned from America and orthomolecular medicine, nutrition-based medicine. They immediately prescribed high-dose intravenous vitamin C and vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc, uh, selenium, magnesium, uh, and vitamin A, 
uh, which prevented people from getting COVID. I mean, anybody that gets COVID that gets 50,000 international units of vitamin D, 50,000 international units of vitamin A retinol, it starts doing approximately maybe 5,000 or to bowel tolerance uh, um, um, uh, milligrams of vitamin C daily for three days. COVID's gone. And every time we have shared that therapy with anyone uh, that gets COVID around the world, COVID's gone. Uh, when you get into the hospitals and the doctors are refusing to give you nutrition, uh, and then you end up really sick, and you end up in a position where you're, you you need a uh, uh, you need a uh, you need to be a ventilator, which really damages your lungs. Uh, and all you need, I'm telling you, is high dose intravenous vitamin C because the first clinical trials on earth regarding COVID and high dose intravenous vitamin C, that didn't come out of America. Uh, Dr. Malik wanted it to happen. He was blocked, the, who brought high dose intravenous vitamin C um, uh, for, st uh, for staph infection, sepsis, the, you know, going in, the, you know, people are walking in the hospital with ER with sepsis and don't get high dose vitamin C, they're dead, okay. Same thing with COVID, you know, walking in the hospital, don't get the, don't get the, the nutrition you need. Uh, they're going to give you pharmaceuticals, but that's why everybody's dying. Now, I'm a funeral director. We have, I, I'm the son of a funeral director, and we've got a number of funeral homes on the west side of Cleveland here. And at the end of the day, we see the effects of pharmaceuticals in dealing with COVID, and we're burying all the people who don't respond well to what medicine is doing to deal with COVID. Why doesn't medicine change? Uh, I think it has to do with money. I think we'll be talking about that a little later. Okay. So at the end of the day, we sit in a position where the first clinical trials validated that vitamin C worked in Wuhan and then traveled throughout China. Finally, when we got the word into America, we developed a relationship that was uh, frontline doctors. Frontline doctors uh, have been promoting, along with Dr. Malik and a number of other major players uh, and, and, and the National Health Federation, uh, the use of nutrition to prevent COVID. No need for a vaccine whatsoever if you just get a little nutrition. So billions of dollars are being spent in the wrong place at the worst time in history. And what we're dealing with is hundreds of thousands of dead people including four members of my family, uh, for no reason at all. And I begged, I begged, and I told, I showed the doctors, the uh, President Trump's uh, right to try act. If what, you're, if what they're prescribing doesn't work and you want to try nutrition or vitamin C, then, you know, you have the right to do that. Uh, they refused. I mean, how much malpractice suits can take place in this country right now is beyond the ability to comprehend. So all four of my dear family, friends, and relatives died. Now, going into the future of medicine in relationship to most people don't even, your doctor's not telling you to take nutrition. They don't advise it. They have five hours of school uh, and medical school. They, how do you learn anything about nutrition when everything that drives your entire body is delivered from nutrition? Today, corporations are taking care of, are growing all the agriculture. Scott Tips can talk about that, the agriculture of, uh, of taking all nutrition out of food, a genetically altered food. <laughs> okay, so why do we have disease? Nobody's dealing with what the body needs to prevent disease, nutrition. Which brings me to Greg Cunyon, who is the, the son and, 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 and he's, he had a relationship with his dad that I, I've envied, uh, God bless Greg and his father, because they worked so closely together throughout uh, Dr. Cunyon's entire life and Greg's entire life. They founded Olaloa, um, uh, a nutrition company. If you, if you don't know anything about nutrition, um, uh, what I would recommend is you get a hold of olaloa.com. It's right behind you, O-L-A-L-O-A, -L -L -A, and at least get going with the finest nutrition program on the face of the earth uh, for dealing with uh, prevention of disease. And in part also dealing with once you get a disease, you double up, you know, uh, vitamins become therapeutic 
as you become sick. If you're, if you're not ill, you can prevent illness with nutrition, moderate amounts. But if you become deathly ill, like if you get scurvy, you know, you have no vitamin C in your body whatsoever, and you get scurvy, you're going to die. Uh, black people in America and around the world, they, their skin prevents their absorption of vitamin D3. So we have lost tens and tens, hundreds of thousands of black people to COVID. One, not one doctor would say, well, you know, if you, if you took a little vitamin C, you wouldn't get COVID. Nobody's telling anyone that. And, and deficiency in nutrition is also going to be discussed by Greg Cunha. You're going to understand why you're done taking pharmaceuticals and you're going to start to feed yourself supplemental nutrition. You can't get the nutrition in food anymore. They've made sure you can't, unless you're growing in your garden. Okay, Greg, can you pick it up, babe? Yes, yes. We should probably clear the screen, though, because I'm going to switch over my screen in a minute as well. So I think uh, Mike's got uh, his screen still being shared. You know, I have to say, Jack, in, in reference to what you were saying, just to take a moment before I start giving you some of the formal aspects of this. You know, my, my much of what you're saying is really, uh, you know, it, it, it just shows you that it's, it's a belief system. And my father came to the term to, to the understanding that when it came to the MD degree, that it really stood for a medical delusion. And it's really two delusions. Uh, the first one being that uh, vitamins, <laughs> uh, vitamins uh, first of all, uh, that number one, uh, drugs work and vitamins don't. And it's incredible when you think back about it that, you know, uh, just going back a little bit in time when, you know, the, the British would send sailors out and uh, they, they'd lose a huge portion of their sailors. And, and even in spite of the fact that they knew that there was something in the lines, it took them 50 years to wake up to the fact and accept the fact that there was something in food that is so important that without it, we die. <laughs> and, and the same Unbelievable. thing was said for modern Modern medicine is notorious for having a, a cult following and it takes them a while uh, to, 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 to wake up. Uh, today, what I wanna do though, is, is, is give you a little perspective on, on more of, I thought Mike, by the way, Mike, you did a great job. Uh, today though, what I thought I would share with you uh, is a little bit about uh, my, my father's journey from becoming a, a recovered psychiatrist and being aware and respecting molecules. So let me uh, let me see here. I've got to I've got to go to uh, share content, okay? And then I'll bring up some some uh, some information here, okay? Hey, Greg. Uh, Greg. Yeah. You know, yeah. you should, You know, Dr. Gonzalez did uh, mention it a number of times, and I want the audience to really understand it, okay? And uh, you just mentioned it, you know, molecules. So you might think that uh, molecules, you know, are, are, are maybe just relevant to nutrition, but pharmaceutical yeah. companies deal with it and you name it. But the whole idea of nutrition, the actual function of a natural uh, 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 delivery of, of food in the form of nutrition, uh, those molecules cure disease <laughs> really well. Well, there's no, there, there's no question. The, the right molecule at the right time can be a very powerful effect. And sometimes it doesn't take, take, take much of, of an ingredient. Uh, let's just, just look at either oxygen or cyanide. Uh, is my screen up? Are you able to see it? Yeah, we can see all the low. You're there, babe. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, I'm, I'm Greg Cunyon. Uh, I am the uh, co-founder of Olaloa Products and the vice chairman of the National Health Federation. And I've had a front row seat on uh, the development of the orthomolecular approach uh, as, since I was just a child. I'm not just somebody who's been aware and part of the movement. I've worked with my father virtually my entire life, uh, was dedicated to, to his vision and his work. And uh, more importantly, uh, I was saved by orthomolecular medicine uh, in so much as I had 
carbohydrate sensitivities as a child. I was very sensitive to, to sugars in particular and was uh, starting to experience trouble at school at a very early age and was suffering from headaches. So I learned early on the power of, uh, of, 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 of food and of nutritional support. So today I'm gonna give you a little perspective on my dad's journey, what led him to understanding uh, the, his, his, his motivation to move from uh, conventional uh, medical practice into the realm of molecular nutrition, orthomolecular approach, nutrition-based uh, approach medicine. And really it comes down to three key words. Uh, and, and my dad would summarize it basically in understanding what is orthomolecular medicine, because this is this hybrid uh, Greek Latin word that Linus came up with. And it's frustrating because it's the most perfect word, the right molecules, but yet no one, uh, many people are, seem to be completely at a loss when it comes, when they hear the word orthomolecular. So my dad summarized it in understanding that orthomolecular medicine was an analysis based on nutrition, pollution, and stress. The right molecules, identifying what was going on really with your biochemical individuality. And so, yes, as it's been said earlier, Linus and my father collaborated together, worked together, and Linus uh, came into my dad's life at, at, at just the right time. And what was most important is that my, my father uh, was, was able to see what was before him. And that's uh, unfortunately a lot of people in the medical field and in other fields, uh, things can be right in front of them and they just don't see it. For those of you who are interested, the National Health Federation is, is fighting for you. There's a great, in the most, one of the, in the most recent uh, magazine, you'll see a great article about my father. And, 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 and I encourage you, you can, you can also see it on our website. Uh, some of you may be familiar with my dad's work. He wrote Mega Nutrition, and Mega Nutrition for Women. He's a co-author in, in a number of, of other books. Uh, and, and it's interesting. So as I stated at the outset, you know, my dad is, it comes out of a conventional medical world. Uh, he was a, a graduate of University of uh, Minnesota in 1955, just by chance, the, the same year, the founding of the National Health Federation, and uh, had a pretty conventional background. Uh, University of Minnesota was part of Cornell New York Hospital, uh, and, in the, and in 1960, he wound up uh, in, in San Francisco and wound up doing a NIH. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. Uh, and he was, he was uh, involved early on in his career uh, in radical psychiatry, uh, in integrating uh, hypnosis and self-hypnosis with his patients and training his patients. And he was one of the first behaviorists. So he had quite a bit of success early on. This is a Time Magazine article. And he was, he was developing a whole new scheme of how to uh, goal orient through goal plan lesson with his patients and through behaviorism and was, was, was really actually doing quite well, but yet he felt that something was not right. And in 1967, the, the light bulb went off. It was, it was a very good year for us. And my father asked one question. He had started to hear pieces of the puzzle. Uh, people were talking about uh, food as nu and nutrition and Linus Pauling, you know, it, there were grumblings in the area of the arena of, of, of these molecules of, of human biochemistry. And my father asked one question, is my patient malnourished? Now, this was considered blasphemy. It may not seem like much today, but for anyone to consider that anyone was not getting adequate nutrients through the average American diet, this, this was considered blasphemy. And so my, my father did a simple test. He started sending blood work in, started running vitamin testing. And sure enough, uh, he found out that his patient, his patients were malnourished. Uh, at, at, at very few times in, your, in, in life, will you ever find something that's 100%? But this turned out to be 100%. I mean, who would have thought that sick patients could be malnourished. <laughs> then in 1968, the following year, my father had another aha moment and he just wanted to know, is it possible that my patient is toxic? And this was the birth of the hair test and heavy metal testing, looking into things like uh, lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic. We were starting to study fluoride. And this was breakthrough. My father was amazed because as he started to do simple interventions, 
simple things like vitamin B12, vitamin C. As he started to, to do these things and he started to use vitamin C as a, as a metal chelator, he was having overwhelming success. I mean, we're talking to the point where mental patients a month later were leaving mental hospitals. So my father thought, well, gosh, maybe his colleagues would want to hear about this. And in 1972, my father was featured in Prevention Magazine. They came to interview him. And this article came out and my father learned very quickly uh, that being the messenger of, of, of this type of information uh, was extraordinarily dangerous. And in a matter of a few days, my father was front page of the, of the San Francisco papers and was being censored by his medical society. The medical board started looking into it. His hospital started looking into it. It, it, it became a big deal. And he realized right away that the dangers of, of, of uh, having, having, having a new thought, dare he say things like, uh, food is good. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, my father started developing the principles that identify orthomolecular medicine. And, you know, when it comes to conventional laboratory, uh, most people are unaware that conventional laboratory is, for, for the most part, made up of a, an incomplete blood count, a urinalysis, a chem panel, which is it's not bad. It gives you some information. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's only looking for present damage right now. Uh, you know, are your white blood cells, uh, you know, spiking? Uh, are, are you suffering from anemia? Are your kidneys starting to fail? Is your liver having problems with liver enzymes? It, 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 gives, it, it gives you uh, some valuable information, but it doesn't tell the whole picture. And in the orthomolecular approach through the analysis based on nutrition, pollution, and stress, we're actually trying to uh, uh, minimize damage. And, and really the ideal time to get this data is before you're symptomatic. So in the nutrition realm, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We're doing micronutrient testing. It's, it's like getting a, a dipstick in your car and finding out whether or not you have any oil in the car. Here we're finding out are, are there any are there any issues with the with the fundamentals, the elements that control and regulate our body function, and it's it's incredible to me how often I'll hear from certain people, physicians in particular, who will tell me, you know, this concept you get everything out of your food, and of course my my father would refer to that as the nutritional death sentence, and routinely I would ask doctors, uh, have have you ever checked a patient for for vitamin levels? And they're making these, these statements without any data. Of course, on the pollution side, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking into, are you toxic? Uh, have you had heavy metal exposure? And it's important to understand that these poisons, uh, oftentimes one and one does not make two. Uh, for some people who have interferences with cholinesterase factor and, and, and other elements to their blood chemistry, we can get into the details of this. Uh, but we're identifying where you have encumbrances and whether or not if, if there's anything identifiable uh, at the outset. And then really where we have really spent the last 40 years has really been in the arena of stress and vulnerability because when it really comes down to stress, this is really a, a adaptive. We're identifying what is happening with the adaptive mechanism of the human body. So we're looking into hormonal stress, and a big factor in an area where we really have concentrated since the mid eighties, blood circulation in, in terms of blood coagulation and clotting activity, uh, which immediately tied into methylation and, and genomic studies that we started to do. And I'll, I'll touch on that because I think it's so important. Uh, people always ask me, you know, what should I find out? What information should I get? And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. So. You know, it's interesting in, in life, it, it's, it's wonderful if you can have one aha moment. And my father was blessed to have a number of uh, insights, I, I think, that were really significant. And this one, I think, really uh, is, is really the big breakthrough when my father realized that ultimately nutrition is circulation, circulation is nutrition. And this really guided us uh, from, from the mid 80s on because my father's work went in the, in, the, in the 60s and early 70s from psychiatry and moved into general practice medicine. And in the last 40 years, much of the focus 
of his work tended to be in relation to vascular disease and cancer. And this became a, a really a big highlight. So when we're looking at blood coagulation, we're talking about things like homocysteine, fibrinogen, lipoprotein A, factors two and five, small dense LDL, all these components that, that can potentially make your uh, blood come to a screeching halt. And it's important for people to recognize the fact that it doesn't require you to have a full occlusion and to have a, a, a massive clotting event take place. All you have to do is lower blood flow just a little bit and you create an ischemic condition. And a lot of people don't realize that they're living through a chronic habitual uh, ischemic uh, situation where their cells, cells are being suffocated. So to put this into perspective, uh, and we can talk more cases if we have time and I can share things with you, but here's a case that we had a number of years ago with a 46 year old male. And this was a guy who was very active his entire life, played, played sports, was, was, he was, was really what appeared to be the epitome of health. Uh, and within about a six month period, he became completely disabled. And as we brought him through the practice and started doing a family history, we found out virtually all males in his family were dead by 55 uh, from a major vascular type of event. And here was a guy who was being scheduled for hip replacement at 46 years old. He literally could not walk. It happened very, very suddenly. And when we checked him out, homocysteine, fibrinogen, and LPA off the charts. This is a guy, you took his blood, you turned around after you put it into a tube and it completely congealed almost instantaneously in, in, in here. Make a long story short, we started treating him before he went into surgery. When they got into surgery, he had, they found that he had, his, his blood flow had been so restricted, he was unable to feed the hip, okay? He was, his, his hip was suffering from necrosis. He was literally, he, his, his hip was dying. It was, it was, instead of a rigid structure, it was becoming gelatinous. These are the kind of people that, you know, you, you, you know they go into a surgery or they, they have a critical event and uh, they go to sleep at night, they don't wake up the next day. Uh, and, and this is commonplace. And, and I can tell you stories about physicians I know, cardio, cardio, cardiovascular specialist, cardiologist too, who, who themselves have had stent surgery and open heart surgery, and they themselves don't even know what their clotting factors are. So it's, uh, this is a, a big piece of, of the puzzle. And it's because of our work with homocysteine uh, that we became completely enthralled with methylation. The, the two are completely tied together. And you'll see in the center of that chart, it doesn't, you know, again, don't overwhelm yourself with the biochemistry of it. Uh, people spend their lifetimes working on this. What's important to recognize is the significance of what this is and, and why homocysteine potentially can play such a, a critical, critical role. When we're talking about methylation, and I, and I feel like I, I have to at least give you a little background on it, you're really telling the story of carbon. We're made up of carbon, but interestingly enough, virtually all carbon compounds are toxic to the human body. Of course, carbon monoxide will kill you. We get rid of acids by breathing and, and, and eliminating carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, you get into methane, you add a nitrogen, you get into cyanide, and you could go further down, down the list. But, but the one carbon that the body uses safely uh, and can be transferred throughout the body, and, and the beautiful thing is it, it doesn't kill you, is, is, is methyl carbon. It's a, it's a carbon with three hydrogens on it. And this, this wonderful molecule reacts with enzymes on one side and vitamin cofactors on the other side. And it's responsible for literally hundreds and hundreds of molecular products, these biologic end products that, that literally control all aspects of, of cellular function. So here are just a list of some of the, the big ones, the energy cycles, you're looking at the neurotransmitters, uh, and, and, and of course, detoxification pathways. And so th this is a big deal. If this system is not working very well, you're, you're in big trouble. And as, a, as we came to realize that the methylation cycle is really our means of being able to assess what is happening with our patients. And it truly is the adaptive system of the body. The body. And, and as my dad would say, it's the fundamental determinant of health because if this system is not working, 
you're at risk for all the majors, heart disease, stroke, cancer, blood vessel damage, and a whole host of inflammatory diseases and, and much more. So it's, it's really the key to heart function and circulation, digestion, uh, detoxification, uh, immunity, brain function, and ultimately energy regulation. So on the circulatory side, of course, homocysteine is a big one. And I keep on harping back on that because it's very difficult for us to avoid. I mean, you can't avoid it. I mean, it, it's an essential. This is, this is uh, it's a two-sided coin. You, you gotta have some homocysteine, uh, but you gotta be careful uh, because it can, become, uh, it can become toxic. And I'll get a little bit into the chemistry of that uh, briefly. Uh, digestion. Uh, interestingly enough, it's, it's a very interesting way. It, it'll, it'll change your view of digestion. People get sometimes uh, fixated on prebiotics and probiotics, but the first organ of the body that starts to fail when you don't methylate well is your pancreas. And the pancreas is, uh, is, is a very, it's very busy. It puts out a quart of bicarbonate a day and, it, and we get into gastrin and secretin again. I don't want to get overwhelmed with chemistry today, but suffice it to say, uh, yeah, a lot of digestive problems occur when you can't turn off acidity in the stomach and the backup uh, acidity in the stomach is histamine. And the turnoff switch is a methylation byproduct called methyl histamine. So you, you cannot escape methylation uh, from digestion. And clearly on the detox side, we're talking glutathione production, transsulfuration, and again, We'll get, we'll get into this if we have time. If we have specifics, uh, I can talk about that more. Uh, I'm really trying to convey to you how, how significant and powerful this overall area of, of human biochemistry is. So this, this will give you a little perspective. I'm just trying to break it down into pieces for you so you can see how we go from homocysteine down into you know, CBS and cystothionine and ultimately get to glutathione. Immunity, of course, everyone is talking about immunity, immunity right now and immune function at, the, at this time when we've got this, uh, you know, these events that are happening right now and uh, people are forgetting the fact how powerful the, the body is. And it's very, very frustrating when modern medicine uh, in the last 18 or 19 months is basically sending people home and saying that there's nothing you can do when in fact we, we know the power of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, the B vitamins. And, and clearly there's a relationship which we have seen now and known for the last year with relation to negative outcome from COVID and, and elevated homocysteine levels in particular. But here with regards to immunity, thymidine product production and protection of DNA and RNA. And that of course is where a lot of the focus of methylation study has been in so much as mutated cells, if DNA gets corrupted, uh, and we can again get into this uh, uh, after I finish, uh, obviously you, 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 you don't want your cells to be mutated cells, which will lead to rogue cells, which is, let's face it, a collection of rogue cells is by definition cancer. So this will give you a little perspective on how essential this system is uh, and the DNA pathway of methylation leading to thymidine and the production of lymphocytes. Again, protection against viruses, cancer, microbial enemies. And of course, if we, if we don't do this, if the system is not working, your DNA is, is vulnerable and genetic damage can, can occur much more readily. So again, I'm just trying to show you, don't, don't be overwhelmed with the chemistry of it. It, what's important is you have a, a little picture of it. And then, of course, on the brain side, neurotransmitter production from acetylcholine, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all made through this process. And ultimately, you know, myelin production, how we protect the nerve sheaths. All these poor people we see on the streets in, in my city in San Francisco who are being destroyed right now by, by drug activity and no one is providing them nutritional support. There's no question these people are in, in grave, grave need of nutritional support. Their brains don't work and they get progressively worse. And lastly, energy regulation. The methylation cycle is responsible for the production of creatine, carnitine, CoQ10, calomodulin, and, and SAMI. So why is this important? And why should you care? Well, 
ultimately, as you dig deeper into this and you start to realize, wow, there is really no, uh, no point in time uh, where, and no state where your hu the human body is concerned that does not somehow or another involve this process. This, this is literally uh, the key to health. This is the, 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 the central point. This is, this is what it's all about. This is what this activity is all about. And I wanted to point out just, again, you don't have to see everything on the chart, but as you go through it, you start to realize, my God, all these conditions are directly related to improper methylation. And so this, this focus has been our, our major focus in working with my dad's patients over the last really 40 years. And of course, uh, you know, some people are starting to hear bits and pieces of this. They're, they're hearing about genetic testing. And, and I, I just wanted to mention it briefly because uh, some people put too much emphasis on finding out their, their, their mutations. Folks, we are all mutants. And epigenetics, you know, th th these things, uh, you know, your, your mood can affect these things. Uh, you know, not enough sleep, overeating, too much sugar, all these things impact it. The, the important thing here is the fact that people are mutated and they sometimes get fixated on it because we're trying to simplify all this. I recognize this is complicated stuff. Uh, you got to be careful when you try to uh, boil it down to a half a dozen uh, gene mutations. MTHFR, some of you may have heard about it. It's commonly uh, I, I, commonly, I get calls about this every single day. Some of our healthiest patients are MTHFR mutated. Uh, and it, it, in many respects, having the mutation can be protective. I don't want to get into all the details of that right now. We could have a whole lecture on, on, um, on MTHFR and how the thiamine synthase plays a role here. And, and, and if there's time, if people have questions, we can talk about it. But I'm just trying to tell you, you are more than your mutations. And ultimately, if you're gonna take methylation seriously, having access to some of the, the, the methylation genomics is, is, is not gonna tell you the whole story. What does tell you the story is what's your homocysteine, your methionine, your SAMHSA ratio, your, what, you know, are you making sarcosine? What's your MMA? These are the things that we would routinely test for. And this really tells you how you are adapting to your mutations. So what did we do? Well, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, uh, I uh, basically pushed and pushed and pushed and my father and I created a line of su support products that are primarily in, uh, in powder form. I tried to make it easy because I realized after talking to our patients, people don't like taking vitamin pills. Tablets, of course, are the worst. They don't absorb. Capsules are a little bit better, but you know they can't be compressed, so you got to take more. And we've tried to make a very strategic line that's that's providing support, in particular for this. And what's great about our product, in particular, because homocysteine was so prevalent, so commonplace, and it, it was very simple. I'll, I'll summarize the one factor that you need to understand when it comes to our patients that suffered from excessive clotting. And it's very simple. Our patients that have the most clotting factors, you put them on the top of the list, those with normal blood viscosity at the bottom of the list on a spreadsheet. And what you find is that everybody at the top of the list with the most clotting activity shares one thing in common. They're all disabled, suffering from premature aging, chronic disease and inflammation. And unfortunately, these are the kinds of people that, that, that die unnecessarily prematurely. And it's tragic that no one is checking. And in particular, homocysteine, the thionine, the methylation cycle. If you've got a homocysteine problem, especially those who are being treated, some people are rushing out and overdoing it with methyl B12. And I could tell you the dangers there later if we have time. But the reality is many of these people actually have issues with, with at the center of that chart, what's called methionine synthase. They have an inability to process homocysteine, B6, B12 and folate don't work very well. And so they can't make the conversion from homocysteine to methionine. For B6, B12 and folate to work, it requires three enzymes and at a minimum, an ideal diet and a lot of luck from start to finish. These, these elements are very, very fragile. 
What's exciting about our product is we have a gram of betaine in our packets and betaine works with your body's own metabolism through a enzyme called betaine homocysteine methyltransferase, BHMT, which is not diet dependent. In fact, if you're fasting, your body makes more BHMT. And oftentimes this is the single reason why people feel good when they start to go on a short-term limited fast. All of a sudden they get a little betaine in the diet. They start uh, producing BHMT and they start lowering homocysteine. So there's this for, for many people, this is a, this is a true lifesaver for these a people. Real, a real lifesaver. So lastly, you know, uh, not to toot my own horn, but if I don't do it, who will? Uh, I, we are I will. I will. Greg. We are the best vitamin drink of natural news. Uh, we're used by uh, numerous people, uh, including the American Clinic and people like Jonathan Wright, Hyla Cass, Dave Foreman. Uh, nutritional pioneers like Tammy Hedberg uh, and sports athletic people like Jimmy Chin have been using our product uh, for a long time. Uh, it doesn't get simpler than this. Uh, a gram of betaine, a gram of glycine, a gram of vitamin C. As it complexes, you're getting mineral ascorbates and mineral complexes. Uh, our product, unfortunately, we could get into this. Uh, we have removed N-acetylcysteine from one of our products it's found in several of our others, and we can get into that because it's a what's happening right now is a tragedy. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration and Big Pharma right now are trying to own an acetylcysteine as a treatment for COVID, and they're now trying to outlaw uh, a substance that we've been selling for 40 years. Uh, we can get into that. Uh, along with all your, your vitamins, A through K, all your B vitamins. We are the only vitamin drink in the world with hydroxy vitamin B12, which is the most bioavailable form of, of vitamin B12. And uh, folks, I hope that gives you a, a perspective on, uh, on, uh, uh, on what we are all about. Uh, and, and what we've tried to create uh, through my dad's legacy and through his strategy. What I really want you to understand, oops, my camera's not working. That's weird. Sorry about that, folks. There I didn't go, realize there my camera's working. Uh, that was not, that was an accident. That wasn't supposed to be happening. Uh, but what I really want you to understand is that there is a strategy. The orthomolecular approach is providing you more information, not less. And what's tragic about this is that uh, conventional medical uh, uh, procedures right now are based on limited blood analysis. And I, I can't understand how anyone would disagree with getting more information and finding out what is happening with you on a, on a more uh, a cellular level to understand what your biochemical individuality is and to identify what's, what, what's potentially going to put you at risk later. You know, we have a, we have a terrible, uh, the system is, is really not healthcare in the United States. It has been taken over by, by, by a corporate structure uh, that's all about disease care. And we're not identifying what is happening and uh, what your vulnerabilities are. The whole point about orthomolecular medicine is, is hopefully to avoid uh, a catastrophic event <laughs> and, and to see things that are happening before they happen. Right. And, and, and it's very frustrating because, uh, you know, th this, this concept of the nutritional death sentence, as my father pointed out in Mega Nutrition, uh, th this idea that, you know, you get absolutely everything that you need in your food is an absurdity. So ridiculous. And they, in the last 30 years, we have learned, A, people do have gene mutations, which can interfere with natural chemistry, which can make, can, can be an encumbrance on your, your biochemical process and your metabolism. Uh, and when you have people who are at risk for low blood flow due to hypercoagulation, uh, which can lead to catastrophic events like heart disease, stroke, cancer, and blood vessel damage. The, the idea that you're perfectly fine up until that day when you have a full occlusion is an absurdity. Low blood flow for an extended period of time uh, leads to suffocation of the cells, nutrient deficiency, 
and a uh, it, 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 it just it, it interferes with your your natural body function. You're not the best you, and it's it's painful that frankly I'm I'm even having to say the obvious. But as I say at the outset of this, there are a lot of physicians, first of all, who don't want to go through those 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 biochemical uh, charts that I started to show you. There's a, there's a lot to know. It's much simpler when a patient comes in and you've got 25 different medications and you've got symptom A, drug B, <laughs> you know, and you just, it's just, that's how it works, folks. Uh, and we, we've got a crisis on our hands. Uh, the world is going broke. Certainly the United States is going broke with, with healthcare costs that are, that are growing exponentially. And what are we getting for our money? It's, it's tragic. And, and what's really tragic is that we're stifling scientific knowledge. And a lot of doctors are fearful. You know, they take the easy path. I understand they want to pay their mortgage. They want to be able to stay in business. Uh, it, they don't want to have to write a letter to an insurance company. But the reality is we are armed with this information. We have a duty. Physicians have a duty. Once you've seen the light, as my father would say, he could not practice medicine the way he was taught. <laughs> you know, and it's fascinating. I mean, it really comes down to this. I'll never forget my dad and Linus Pauling were doing an interview at Stanford. And we started talking about the, 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 the dichotomy between the recommended daily allowance and, and pharmaceutical medicine. And when it comes to a pharmaceutical medication, we're actually trying to identify What's the maximum amount of a substance we can give you without killing you? <laughs> and when it comes to the recommended daily allowance and nutritional supplements, the, the molecules that make life possible, what are we trying to do? We're trying to determine what's the least amount of a substance we can give you to keep you alive. <laughs> but it's not the daily, optimum. The daily minimum course, requirement. Well, people have become very confused about this and they see these numbers 100%. Oh, I've, I'm hitting 100%. And this is, this is really terrible because when, these, when this whole nomenclature started, it was not known as the RDA or the RDI. It was known as the minimum daily requirement, the MDR. And in large measure, this conveyed to people a little bit more truthfully the fact that what it was, this is absolutely a minimum to get you through it. It doesn't take into consideration your genetics and your exposure to uh, whether, whether it be heavy metals or you know, halogens, blah, 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 blah. And interferences with your, you know, you know, your biochemistry and mutations that may be occurring here. And so a lot of people are going on a false premise that, that they're okay and they're not being checked and they've got limited data. So I, I think that, you know, once you see this, the logic behind the orthomolecular approach of understanding nutrition, pollution, and stress makes perfect sense. And therefore, uh, I hope this has inspired you to learn more. Certainly, you can go to our website at olaloa.com or drinkyourvitamins.com. I have information there, uh, articles that my dad's written, excerpts from books that he's been a co-author of. Uh, we're, we're in the process right now of doing a, an incredible historical project of orthomolecular. I've taken all the lectures over the last 50 years and we've digitized them. Everyone from uh, Abe Hoffer, my dad, Linus Pauling, uh, you, go, you go down the line. I, I've got just, it's great material. And what's incredible about it is that scientific truth, if it's real truth, it, 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 it stands the test of time. And right. here it is, I hear some of these lectures from 30, 40 years ago that my father's giving, and it, it's breathtaking. And I hear about people who hear about some of my dad's work who are treating, for example, psychiatric patients. I mean, there you can see a difference with people. It's absolutely incredible. And they're doing some of the simple things that my dad was doing in 1975, where he's treating patients with niacin and vitamin C and vitamin B12. And these people are having radical transformations. It, 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 it's very exciting. And uh, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful.
You know, Greg, I want to so, just take a minute. Forgive me, Dr. Uh, Jorge, were you about to say something? Can't hear you're you. You're muted. You're muted, doctor. I just feel like I'm in my family because we're speaking the same language with the same passion. <laughs> I can't. You're, you're the next speaker. So this is quite interesting to me. Greg, um, yeah. two points. Two points. Okay. Our sure. audience is catching on that there's an amazing amount of information that needs to be known about how not to fall into the fear factors that doctors want you in so that you can be focused on nothing but their, 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 uh, uh, their pharmaceutical uh, uh, products uh, and absolutely devoid of any nutrition whatsoever, which is the only thing that actually feeds the body, okay? So I want to make a well, point. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, let, let's understand something. Uh, the, the, the medical industrial complex is, is not some small little business. Uh, no. The guys who are making these, these synthetic molecules, uh, uh, these guys are, they're, they're not multi-billionaires, uh, you know, uh, because they're imbeciles. I mean, they're drug dealers. Okay. And, and, and drug dealers like to sell, to sell a product. Uh, and it, they don't like the idea that, you know, there's a, a 10 cent cure when there's a thousand dollar cure that they, they, that they can make. And they got a big operation. They, they, they got to keep turning the wheels and they got to, they got to, they got to, you know, they got to, they got a lot of bills to pay. So, uh, you know, I think it's very, very important for people to realize, uh, human nature is at play here. The fear factor is absolutely palpable. And the idea, uh, let, let's remember, I mean, like right, right now, here we are dealing with the so-called pandemic. <laughs> uh, 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 let, let's face it, the, the vast majority of the people who come down with, with COVID survive. And they have survived, you know, with, with, nothing, with, with nothing else but what, what's, what's available over the counter uh, for the most part. Uh, and, and here we are trying to get people to believe, no, no, no. There's only one. There's only one answer now. There's only one answer, and 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 that's this incredible experiment with with uh, with a so-called gene therapy, and uh, the idea that uh, uh, immune function they 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 they've lost touch with immune function altogether and how the body works. So it's it's very very exciting, and I know personally physicians who have worked with people with COVID who have had great success. Uh, using the molecules that that that, that function for, for the human body. I mean, it, it, we're we're living in crazy times. What I what I hope people understand from what I just said in this talk is that uh, a there's hope, <laughs> and that there is a better way, and that the orthomolecular approach through analysis of nutrition, pollution, and, and stress makes sense. Thank you, Greg. Listen, I, um, I, you know, Greg, Greg, he's gone. I didn't want him to leave. Okay. No, okay. I'm not gone. Sorry about that. My, okay. my yeah, Greg, actually, Greg, hold on. Okay. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm, again, uh, as the chairman of the foundation and helping to produce all of this and educating people and making this a life's dedication now, and the perspective of being a, you know, the funeral director that deals with all of the horrors and end results of mainstream medicine's care of human beings. I mean, that's how they end up on the embalming room table. That's why we bury them. They're not healthy. They can't get healthy. They don't know where to go to get healthy. And at the end of the day, it's enough to make me crazy. Okay. You've given a beautiful insight. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend when you have a problem and you go to see your doctor, the first thing you want to look at your doctor and say is, listen, your normal testing isn't going to help me. I need you to test me. Now, you want to finish that question, that answer, Greg? What do they want to say to their doctor with regards to testing? Well, first and foremost, it, it, it's important. You need, first of all, you need to find somebody. And you need to find somebody before you actually come down with symptoms. 
Uh, you know, when you get into a crisis, uh, fear is a very motivating factor and people get scared. And it can be very difficult when you, you don't have anyone backing you up. There are obviously great people here. I see my, my good friend, uh, Dr. Led Saputo is here. And uh, there are great, great physicians out there who understand this logic in identifying what's going on with your individual biochemistry. And that's the starting point. I mean, okay. the, the amazing thing is that there's any argument about this at all. Uh, but you know what? It, most importantly, A, find somebody. B, you must become your best advocate. Okay. Uh, a, a number of these physicians, you will find you will run into roadblocks. They can't talk to you intelligently about these things because they don't know. I mean, as I was mentioning in the talk, as I gave that case study, I was at an event a number of years ago with a physician who I personally knew who's a, who's a cardiologist at one of the leading facilities in Northern California. And this is a man who had just had stent surgery. He, he was at the time, he was actually younger than I am now. He just had stent surgery. He is a cardiologist and here we are at this dinner party and I started talking to him because there are a bunch of doctors there and I asked him, I said, well, what's your homocysteine? What's your fibrinogen? What's your LPA? This doctor looked at me like a deer in the headlights, had absolutely no idea whatsoever. Nine months later, this guy looked 20 years older than my father and he wasn't feeling good. So, I mean, I'm here with these guys, they're transplant surgeons from UCSF. I got a couple of hematologists that are there. I started telling them about what I told you during my talk about the fact that it's very simple. Our patients that have hypercoagulation and multiple clotting factors that are elevated, uh, they're all disabled. It's, it's very simple. You don't need to be a doctor to understand that. Uh, and I, I asked these guys, I said, how is it possible? I, in fact, I, I asked the doctor, I said, I'm just curious about your stent. I said, what, what, what was your stent coated in? We said, oh, it was long, long lasting, slow release heparin. I went, well, that's interesting. They're treating the stent so that you, you, know, so that you don't die from the stent surgery. That's interesting. I, I said, how is it possible that you guys are performing surgery on patients and you don't check to see if any of them have clotting risk factors? instantaneously, the doctors from this major medical institution say to me, well, we don't check anything that's not generally uh, covered by insurance. Well, by, by, the, end of, oh. by, the, end of the, uh, by the end of the conversation, uh, the cardiologist was in tears. You know, and they wanted to know where I went to medical school. The hematologists were, were very excited. You know, we were, I was talking their language, <laughs> but this is the, the tragedy. You know, when people get sick, they really want to be able to turn over all the power to someone. Just please, dear God, help me. Heal me. You, you know, you, you're going to have to be proactive and you, you can't have fear. You have to do some of your own research. And there's great research out there on a, a lot of websites. If you go to Dr. Saputo's website, you'll find great information. If you go to our website, articles that my dad has, has written. and the, the unfortunate thing is, you know, I, I really, I, I'm, I'm shocked because every time I think about it, I can't believe it. It was 50 years, 50 years ago, we started showing that people were malnourished. It's 50 years later and we're still having this controversy and we're, so still, you know, it's just, it's just good medicine. It's, it, it, this is crazy. Gregory, Gregory, um, we got to yeah. move on now and I really yes. thank you, but do me a favor. Uh, Everyone in the audience understand this. You got to prevent illness. Uh, can't wait till you guys hear from Beatrice later. Uh, and how you, how you tend to taking care of yourself, how you become literally your own doctor by, by learning a little bit about nutrition. Okay. In lieu of all of that, because most of you know nothing about it and you trust these doctors, I beg you to do me a favor. Go to olaloa.com and get some nutrition. Okay. And, and, don't stop taking it. Believe me when I tell you, I'm, <laughs> seven, I'm 75 years old and I'm a product of life plus nutrition. Dr. Dwight McKee who's on our board for 38 years and they founded the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I can tell you this, uh, you wanna get to the National Health Federation. You wanna become a member of the National Health Federation. You wanna donate to the National Health Federation because their library excels 
in the most unparalleled delivery of information beyond the ability to comprehend the years of information there to, to assist you in your learning interests, okay? Uh, but keep in mind, they're actually in the field, in the, in the cities, in the states. Uh, they're dealing with the, uh, the Codex Almentarius Commission. And at the end of the day, they're fighting for our freedom to make health decisions rather than to be dominated tyrannically, uh, forced to take very unhealthy vaccines. Tip of the ice. Can I say one thing? Go. I just want to say one thing. Uh, the audience must understand that this is, a, this is a very serious situation that we are in. Uh, medicine and science does not grow when people are being silenced. And this is a very dangerous time when First Amendment rights uh, are, being, are, being, are being wiped out and, and science and knowledge is being eliminated. People are, be, are literally being removed from the, the major channels of, of, of discourse. And it's absolutely essential organizations like the National Health Federation have the, have the power of pooling people together and being able to make a difference. It's absolutely essential. And don't think that for a minute uh, that you, you're gonna have access to this information or these physicians or these products. There are groups right now that are in the process. We don't have time to get into it now, uh, but you will learn about it at the nhf.com. There are groups right now that are in major industry, multinational corporations that are trying to make it difficult for you to gain access to this information, to these people and these products. And yeah, they, this is they, why it's crucial right now for the NHF and for our, our audience to become members of the NHF, because if, if you don't fight for your rights, you're going to lose them. NHF is the only agency on earth fighting for your rights to health, the, the ability to achieve the nutrition you need to feed your families, yourself, the 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 values in food to protect toxins in food, agriculture. It is a war zone that stretches across multiple industries leading to what we spoke about yesterday. Uh, fluoride in water makes, takes testosterone out of men. I, I reckon I could, I might be wrong with that, but it makes them less aggressive. Uh, uh, estrogen in water, uh, makes everybody uh, uh, makes everybody there. a bit more fem a bit more feminine but feminine. actually surprisingly enough for women it does the opposite it makes them less so and with men it's definitely a feminizing hormone it's not so much a matter of aggression as it is just simply they don't act like men very much. They're, you know, less decisive, less single-minded, that sort of thing. But I did want to say one thing, Jack, and I appreciate all those great words about NHF is that we don't want to minimize. There are some other organizations out there doing a lot of good stuff. But if I could just say there are none of them, and this is what's sort of the icing on the cake of what you were saying. There are none of them at the Codex Alimentarius meeting. Oh, I just wow. was late getting to this event because I was at the Codex Alimentarius meeting today, second day of the Codex Alimentarius commission meeting, virtual meeting, a Zoom meeting like this one, and had to speak out on a couple of matters. And we were the NHF was the only organization there speaking out against glyphosate. In fact, actually, when I think about it, we were the only uh, accredited entity out of 600 participants to speak out against glyphosate. And we even submitted a document, which you can find on social media. You'll eventually see it on our website sooner rather than later. But we just submitted this document which I wrote uh, about glyphosate and how glyphosate is the main cause for antimicrobial resistance around the world. 
And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people, the food engineers and so on at Codex Alimentarius, they don't even know that, but they know it as of today. They can't hide behind it because I spoke up about it. And we have the written document submitted that's on the Codex web website for everyone to access. So there are those, those events, but I just want to emphasize there are other organizations out there, some of whom are kind of fake organizations and the others are real genuine. You kind of have to decide which is which, but there are some out there doing some real good. They just aren't doing it at the Codex meeting because they aren't accredited like we are, like National Health Federation is, so they can't participate actively at the meetings and, um, and try to change things on a global scale. Anyway, just wanted to throw that in, Jack. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's Scott Tips. He's, he is a global leader. He's, and forgive me, Scott, I'm just gonna tell the people that are most dear to me viewing this and who will see this video, that there is absolutely no agency on earth like NHF, that you absolutely have to find your way to www.thenhf.com and you need to invest in it so that we can protect our children from the horrors that we are experiencing beginning with COVID. And excuse me, let me explain something to you. 13 years old in my father's funeral home, I simply asked my dad, why is Uncle Pete dead? And what is the story about diabetes? How is heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, 13 years old, killing everybody? He says, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Don't stop crying. In 20 to 25 years, the miracle of medicine will be eliminate cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. It is over. 60 years later, we are burying children with diabetes at six years old. They gave it a new name. We're burying children with cancer, blood cancer. It's unbelievable, seven, eight, 10 years old. And we're burying children from heart disease. Heart disease. Can you imagine this in our children? Forget that the flu We've been giving people, they call it the flu shot. That's a flu vaccine. They've been giving it to you for, for 30 years. But what's killing the entire world and altering all of our freedoms? A flu. COVID is a flu. Take vitamin C, D, 3, A, and goodbye COVID. But nobody's telling you. You must support the National Health Federation to have an impact in returning health to humanity. Greg, people want us to lead them. They want their doctors to lead them, but they don't, they, they lead you to the funeral hall. You know how many people we lost for absolutely no reason whatsoever in the last two and a half years? Ladies and gentlemen, support National Health Federation and tell everyone, take a screenshot of what's up with your phone and send it to everybody in your address book. That's what you have to do to defeat what's killing your family right now. And if you don't do it, you know, depopulation, anybody hear about the word depopulation? Please be wise. Listen to people that are working very closely with the, with the World Leader Summit because the World Leader Summit delivers truthfully the leaders in the field of making life better in the world okay i think now, they get it jack well, i hope they get it because i'm 75 <laughs> and i can't scream any louder okay hey uh dr uh uh, uh miranda uh, uh, this is like a great moment um because you're so close to dr gonzalez and i i pray that um um, you, I think what the people are going to hear from you is going to make a difference and support what I've just said to them. So would you mind? Uh, let me introduce you, though, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, let me do this. I want them to know who you are. OK, and a, it'll take a little it'll take a second here, a little more than a second. OK. Dr. Miranda is from the University of Portugal School of Pharmacy. 
So you're talking about pharmacy, go to the drugstore to get your vaccine, go to the drugstore to get your toxic, you name it. Uh, so he's actually the pharmacist. Okay, doc. Now, uh, uh, he's also studied professor of pharmacogenesis. Have I said that correctly? Uh, pharmacognosy and uh, phytotherapy. Yeah, botanical medicines. So he really is a crossover guy. Something like Dr. Kunyan, really something special. Something like Dr. Saputo. These guys transition into a world of, of, of uh, healthy focuses on what you need to stay healthy. Uh, Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame, what an honor. Uh, to have you uh, with us today, doctor. Take it over. It's an honor for me to, to be in, invited to this distinguished audience. Uh, uh, shall I put the PDF or the PowerPoint? Up to you. I think the PDF okay. works. Okay, let's see. Tell me if it's showing. Yep, there you go, babe. Oh, okay. Um, and um, okay, so uh, we're talking about metabolic optimization, but we'll go through a, a journey very quickly. Fortunately, like uh, a, a lot of people have talked on the topics that I'll be talking, so I can I can do it quickly. Uh, um, I'm dedicating this to people who inspired us, family, and, and, and those uh, on, on the lower uh, right corner are my ancestors who were pharmacists as well. Wow. My, my, here was my, my deceased wife and my mother and father who died from cancer and they're my mentor, Dr. Jordan. And that's uh, Michael who, who, who kind of influenced me a lot. And, and his family. And I'd like to start with a little bit of history and how physicians uh, uh, were used to advertise uh, uh, cigarettes, all right, of all things. And, uh, and of course, it was only in 1954 when, when the industry uh, strategies realized that they can no longer uh, sustain credibility that the strategies from the industry stop it. It wasn't physicians themselves uh, then, but, but toxin have been used in medical practice for a while, mercury, arsenic, aluminum, I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but I just want to remind you. Uh, uh, aluminum, for example, has a lot of problems. There's no list, we're not gonna be, uh, read it. But looking to, uh, there's a lot of vaccines that have uh, aluminum. And as you can see from this publication uh, from a, a medical journal uh, in 2018, you can see that children are exposed to a lot more uh, aluminum that they're supposed to. I mean, they exceed far, far exceed the, the maximum residue limits for aluminum. And I, I'll show you here that we, when, you know, we cannot avoid aluminum in nature, but when you look into the natural sources and, and, and the food and the amount of, of, of aluminum in there, it's not that great. And also it's not very much absorbed. I, I highlighted even spinach has some amount of aluminum, but, but uh, when you look at the bottom part, uh, uh, those are the ones administered in the medical field and those go by injection. So everything is 100% bioavailable, different to the others that are not much less bioavailable. So here's the problem. Uh, I'm using here the word pharmaceutical, which is Toxic molecular, uh, I'm, I'm stealing from Kooning, uh, from the doctor, to, uh, father, <laughs> Richard Kooning. Um, so we're addressing symptoms and like, uh, like in the tree, that would be the leaves. Uh, but, but we have a problem 
and uh, we don't look into the causes. Uh, the problem with pharmaceuticals are that they're synthetic molecules that, that often cause a lot of toxicity. They deplete the nutrients. They, they also damage the mitochondria and they're very expensive. And actually I, I mentioned uh, money because that this, this is why, uh, why we teach in medical school the way we teach. And that's uh, why um, in the USA is kind of the worst situation about uh, using me medications and technology uh, to enrich uh, some, some groups. And I'm showing you here, like uh, uh, this table of drug-induced nutrient depletion. You can see here a list of medications uh, and, and the nutrients Doctor, that are Doctor, you have to you have to hit the, the, the first slide of the cigarettes and the doctors, doctors promoting cigarettes. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so we can't get past that slide until unless you shift us out of it. Oh, hold on. So we're hold still on. on the first slide. Oh, hold on. Then let I'm me not see. sure what to do. Yeah. Uh oh. So I thought that by moving. I, are you seeing the movie? There you go. We've now got a graph and we've okay. got a list of aluminum awesome. toxicity, aluminum toxins in medical practice. Mercury, arsenic, know. aluminum toxicity, FDA, FDA aluminum, safe limit. Yeah. These, these are the aluminum toxicity, maximum residue limit. Yeah, they exceed by far, uh, you know, only when you get to a gold hold, uh, adult hold, then the, you don't exceed the maximum residue limits. Uh, these, these are the aluminum intakes oral and, uh, and uh, parenteral. And, and now uh, we're talking about uh, what, what we, uh, I mentioned before related to the tree. Uh, we, we only treat the symptoms with uh, uh, medicine teaching the school with pharmaceuticals. We don't address the cost, which is uh, what we need to do. And uh, synthetic molecules, uh, deplete nutrients and, and, and not only that, but they damage the mitochondria and they're very expensive. So here we're talking about medications, uh, different medication, I give you a list, we don't have to go about it, but uh, they deplete nutrients by different mechanisms. And, and the thing is, once you start with one medication, then it causes some other problem. So we have to give another medication. It causes another problem. You have to give another medication. Uh, and it's a very nice business model, but not a very good one to, to heal. So, uh, and I'm quoting here uh, an example related to, to iatrogenic depression. A, a, a paper in a published in JAMA uh, um, look into this and they, they discovered that one in three adults uh, um, are the medication they're taking is linked to depression. And uh, either the uh, proton pump inhibitors which block uh, acid like uh, H2 blockers uh, and beta blockers and, uh, which are used for blood pressures and some other analgesic when they combine each other, they increase the probability of people having depression because they block uh, B12. That's what, uh, what uh, Dr. Kooning was talking about. Uh, so he, here's another chart of, of, of drugs and, and depletions that they cause is all kinds of vitamins and minerals. And here's a, a table in which we're looking into the uh, group of drugs and different mechanisms by which they cause mitochondrial toxicity. If you look there, you, you will see acetaminophen and you, you will see ibuprofen and some antibiotics and some antivirals. Uh, and uh, this is to stress that uh, mitochondria is very important for health and uh, 
and toxins, drugs, infections, and inflammation damage, damage them. So in, in this way, uh, drugs are like to toxins. They, they increase uh, oxidative stress and damage the mitochondria. And why we need the mitochondria? Well, we all know it, it helps produce energy, but it has so many other important uh, functions, thermogenesis, immunity, calcium balance, redox regulations, cell signaling, uh, program health, uh, cell death, and very, very important stem cell regulation, which is a means to recover from any chronic condition. Uh, and this is why when, when you look at, uh, at the expenditure in, health, in the healthcare system per capita, uh, and you put a, like a, uh, 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 an amount of, of uh, different countries, you will see that US, uh, United States of America, uh, spend two and a half times the average of these rich nations. Two and a half the, the average, okay? That's very significant because you think if a, if a country spend that much in healthcare, they would have definitely the best healthcare possible. Okay, let's look at results. Well, the United Nations uh, has a, uh, a way of looking at this by looking at results, results, uh, and USA always goes last. In the, you know, the one that spends the most achieves the less uh, healthcare outcomes. Japan is number one. You will see there Switzerland, Singapore, uh, Spain, Italy, Australia, Iceland, Israel. But at the end, you will see United States. And actually I put in there uh, Puerto Rico, it, like if it's a bit better than, than, uh, than USA, but I only put it because uh, that our longevity is a little bit better. We have uh, 79.9 uh, years um, uh, versus 78.8 in USA. However, the Health Olympics looks not just at longevity, they, they look at, uh, at other things as well. Anyway, uh, looking at uh, the universal health care plan in Japan, you know, I'm not gonna read everything in this, but they do have the longest uh, life expectancy and the second lowest infant mortality, but they, they, prom they have a system which, in which they promote people to look at uh, to, to see their doctor very often. And, and healthcare is looked at in, in a way that is more accessible and, and they put caps in the fees for medical ser services and pharmaceuticals. Now let's look at US and their healthcare system. The US Surgeon General is supposed to be there to provide the best uh, scientific information available to improve health and reduce risk of illness and injury, right? Uh, they report to, to the US uh, Commission. Uh, they're the heads of the public health services. Um, they, they report to the Secretary of Health, but they don't talk about diet, supplement, exercise, rest, and relaxation during the pandemic, right? The, in fact, no, no, no one is talking about it. Uh, in fact, the university is not talking. They, they actually, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and I are professors in the university. Uh, we try to have a, a dialogue, a debate on these topics. Uh, and, and, uh, and the administrator don't allow any discussion because it would seem that we're opposing the vaccines and we don't want to give that impression. So the NIH uh, mission is to develop research to en enhance health, uh, lengthen life and reduce illness and disability, yet they decrease the vitamin research funding by 66%. And it goes on and on and on. Now let's talk about the FDA. 
which it was created to defend the health from fraud. You know, the people of USA from fraud, uh, from selling snake oils. Well, 60% of people who left uh, FDA went on to work for the pharmaceutical industry. And, and, and yet, um, and I'll give you some examples here. Uh, these people who, who uh, were in and out FDA and then Pfizer, FDA and then Moderna and, and so on. So uh, it's, it's like a, 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 like a, a revolving door. Now let's talk about medical advertising because, uh, oh, let's, the literature, let's cite the literature, right? The literature in the big medical journals. However, the obligation of the journals is to provide accurate information to, to, for the physicians and their patients. Uh, and some people say they shouldn't accept advertising for pharmaceutical companies uh, because it, it can become, and it has become a corrupting influence. Uh, and that was said by a former editor of the British Medical Journal. In fact, I look it up and I found that in 2018, the revenue for, of the medical journals uh, well in, in, was in $343 million. Nice. Uh, and look at this. Uh, these are the, the mean numbers of pages in the pharmaceutical journals devoted to uh, to pharmaceutical ads. And these are the revenues uh, in, in millions of dollars uh, over the years. Uh, also, uh, the advertising is, uh, is not conveying the real information. For example, uh, you have to treat a lot of the, the NTT is a number needed to treat the I should not go too, too far uh, uh, with that. It's related to the amount of people you have to treat to avoid a consequence. That would be if it's a, a cholesterol lowering agent, it would be to, to avoid a, a, a heart attack. Well, um, the idea would be that everybody who, who receives a medication will receive a benefit, but oftentimes it's that one, you have to treat a hundred patients to get one person to avoid a heart attack. And, and I'm giving you two examples of, uh, uh, this, is, this was a real advertising. I just changed from uh, brand name to, to generic name, uh, saying that these drugs lowers the heart attack uh, by 36% when in fact it's 1% and they're using a statistical trick. That's what they do. They, they look into what's the absolute risk um, versus the relative risk. And so they make a, they, they make a comparison because uh, when, when you look, uh, it, the absolute risk is one is 3% if you don't take the drug and it's 1.9 if you take the drug. So the difference would be 1.1%. But because if there's a proportion, when you put the proportion between uh, 1.9 and three, that converts into 36% relative risk reduction. So, so they mislead people. That's, uh, and, and physicians fell for it. So metabolic correction uh, improve, can improve uh, health or, uh, out, healthcare outcomes. Uh, uh, medical diagnosis uh, is, is just a label to identify a, a treatment protocol and, and, and produce. So physician gets the impression because they put a label on it uh, and, and they're putting the, the approved protocol, they're doing great for, for their patients, but they're not. They're, they're just uh, not going to the root problem. And uh, we previously talked about uh, uh, 
um, cause of, of death. Well, in, in one journal, it was said that uh, there was um, that the third leading cause of death was medical error, but I'll, I'll show you more. Well, if you look at iatrogenic condition, which is a medical intervention of some sort, it could be errors or it could be something else. Uh, it, it is actually the first, it's the leading cause of death. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Death by Medicine by Gary Null. It was published in 2010. So it's almost, it's almost like uh, 900,000 death, more, more than cardiovascular, more than cancer. And uh, in that same paper, I, I'm just kind of giving you the details of this, but in the, from the same, uh, from the same uh, paper, uh, you can see uh, medical errors and adverse effects, which is not the same thing. Uh, you, you can have adverse effects, even if it's not an error, uh, bad source infection, malnutrition, unnecessary procedures, et cetera. And you can see not on in here, if you uh, uh, some like this, you, you almost have a million deaths. And if you look at the, at the economic cost, it's $468 billion. It's just astounding. And uh, uh, Michael uh, uh, showed uh, at this paper, 1995, Johnson and Bootman, he was looking at the, at the cost of morbidity and mortality. Well, this was followed up by Ernest and Grizzle. They follow up a few years later and found out that uh, instead of being 70, 76 billion, it was 177. And at that rate, I calculated the, the amount. Uh, I stopped calculating in 2019. Is 1,416 billion in, in, nine, in, in 2019. This is the drug-related morbidity and mortality. We're killing people. And it's very costly. Um, so metabolic, we need metabolic. Uh, um, correction and optimization and orthomolecular medicine to, to improve this. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Koning was mentioning uh, about Dr. Lind. <laughs> there was a, a lot of people dying and, and yes, it was uh, Dr. Lind published this his treaty on a scurvy uh, in, in, in 1753 uh, and they didn't understand how to uh, implement, so they stopped giving, they, they never gave uh, for 50 years, for almost 50 years, and, they, and it cost about 350,000 lives. Same always, the same thing. So this keep happening today, it's the same problem. Uh, so let's look at diabetes during, during, during the last 60 years. Uh, these are the, the, uh, the number of, of, of people with diabetes over the last 60 years. It used to, to, to have a percent, less than 1% of the people uh, uh, had uh, diabetes. And now it's over eight, 10. In Puerto Rico, we have like 15% diabetes. This is all uh, lifestyle. And so, but the thing is that the reason I want to point at this is, look, I mean, it, this graph started in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2015. So I'm saying, are we continuing doing the same thing and, 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 and ever increasing diabetes and we keep doing the same things? We cannot continue. We're gonna kill, everybody's gonna have diabetes if we, if we, if we keep doing the same things. We need to do it better. So um, if your doctor prescribes you a medication without asking you about your diet, hydration, exercise, rest and sleep, stress and life and inner peace, what you have is not a doctor, it's a drug dealer. That's why I was laughing because somebody mentioned that before. 
And so this is, this is the, the model, the model of health, the way of the health. So, uh, and, and, I, and I have like uh, exercise trauma, uh, energy fields, physiological interactors that include nutrients, botanical, drug toxins, bi microbiome, and thoughts, beliefs, all of these uh, combine and balance in a way to, to influence our metabolic process, energy, molecule signals, neurotransmitters, and it does, uh, and there's an interaction that occurs between genetics, the genes, and the epigenetics, the expression of those genes. Uh, and, and, and that produces either health or disease, depending on, 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 on which factors were combined there. So, so food, lack of exercise, la uh, activity, inactivity, alcohol intake, toxins, so, so I divide it into groups, chemicals, foods, water, household products, which are chemicals too. Uh, and, and, and we bring a lot of very unhealthy chemicals to our house. Uh, we, we, like a, a lot of people put uh, aluminum uh, in their armpits. Uh, they, they cook with aluminum, uh, uh, appliances, uh, perfume, toothpaste, you know, even even medications are toxic. They put it, they put mercury in, in the mouth of people. Uh, uh, of course, there's environmental toxins, but there are other kinds of toxins: stress, and and noise, and exercise and rest and, and electromagnetic uh, contamination. And, uh, and, and the, there's an important uh, aspect uh, about health related to our inner peace, spirituality, and love. And, and regarding to our specialty, right? Uh, metabolic correction and optimization is related to food, based the chemistry of the food, uh, that have macronutrients and micronutrients that they will provide uh, energy and molecules for repair. And, and we, we need to understand these are the elements that either move them to healthy physiology or to, or to disease. <clears throat> so there's a better way, let's, and we already found it. Here is, is an example of, uh, of nerves that, um, that, and a biopsy uh, six months later, uh, this is related to neuropathy uh, and, and, and nerve regeneration. We, we know it can be done if the people eat right and complement whatever nutrients they're lacking. Uh, this, this is related to, to some, uh, to the impact that we can have, mo monetary impact we can have, uh, by by uh, implementing metabolic uh, correction, uh, and in fact, we we uh, the cost of of diabetes in Puerto Rico uh, is about fifteen hundred million dollars just diabetes, and we know we can impact that and lower it down uh, if we implement uh, with um, metabolic correction only in fifty percent of the population. Uh, the, all these millions of dollars, $60 million in reductions in diabetes complications, in adverse effects of, of medications, in loss of productivity, and, and uh, it adds up up to $770 and $48 million. We, we published we publish a, a, a study on metabolic correction in, on, in a small group of patients, 50 patients, uh, and it was about six months. We only we only controlled, like reduced uh, carbohydrates and and supplemented a little magnesium. And with the, with that little intervention, we were able to demonstrate significant reductions in the cost of pharmaceuticals and improvement in a lot of uh, 
uh, biochemical and anthropometric measures. Uh, so we know there's a lot of potential for, for improvement, but when, when, you, when you do metabolic optimization or tomolecular um, nutrition-based medicine. <clears throat> and uh, let, me, let me move forward. Uh, he, here's some uh, other people that contribute very importantly, Dr. Robert, uh, Roger Williams uh, taught about genetic uh, polymorphism and, and, uh, and genetotropic uh, illness. Uh, so, so we learn about, um, about individuality with him. And, and uh, with, with uh, Dr. Bruce Ames, uh, we learned that uh, when, when a micronutrient is, uh, is uh, limited in availability, that what will happen is that uh, the available amount will go uh, to the survival on the short term. So that means that it moves away from regulation, DNA repair, uh, and therefore it, it, um, it, it, it will damage, not, you know, we, we will survive in the, in the short term, but it will damage long-term uh, survival. <clears throat> Now, we were talking previously about a, a nutritional inadequacies, and I, I, um, I want to go uh, real quick to, to this definition, the estimated average requirement. This is the nutrient intake uh, estimated to meet the 50% 50, 50 of uh, re the requirement of 50% of the healthy individuals, healthy individuals. Uh, and I, I move here to the NHANES study that showed that 40 in, this is USA, this is USA 21st century, 2020. 46% uh, of people are insufficient in vitamin C, 45% in vitamin A, 52% in magnesium, 95% in, in vitamin D and we don't treat this, it's a shame. Uh, um, by the way, I, I actually noticed that this is not, I, I have another one in which I, I put iodide. We're ignoring iodide and we should include it. This, it's not here in this version, but uh, I can send you an updated version. Uh, now, uh, we have, uh, different needs uh, and those different needs is related from either mutations, like uh, we were talking earlier that everybody's a mutant, but uh, we, we also, it's, it's not just genes, it's also epigenetics. So we have different sources of variation. So genes are inherited and epigenetic mod modification could be inherited as well, but those have to do with what we or our parents do, and those can be changed. But important thing is that when that we can change uh, and we can improve if we recognize these these uh, epigenetic changes. Uh, how we do it with well with diet supplementation but we need to identify those and we need to, to make laboratory testing. I'm not, I'm not gonna um, define metabolic correction because uh, you already know this is improvement, is is orthomolecular medicine. Uh, and and, and we, we look into a, a structure model to make it efficient, right? And, and uh, we look into, uh, the metabolic pathways, and, and, and that's very important. MTHFR is the first one over here. You can see uh, that we have all the enzymes that produce glutathione, vitamin D, COMT. And, and here, here are the same or similar uh, <clears throat> pathways that we were talking earlier, be because if we can influence them greatly if we, if we it give the cofactors that to move the enzymes and produce the, the molecules that we need. The, 
the vitamin D receptor is very important and, and it could be importantly affected. And we know it, it affects many conditions, osteoarthritis, cancer, diabetes, immune infections, everything. <clears throat> Liver detoxification, and we have a lot of toxins and every path uh, detoxification pathway uh, needs different vitamins and minerals to, to work out and eliminate toxins from the body, which might be the cause of disease. This is just a definition of epigenetics, but uh, I, I just wanted to, <clears throat> to, to um, include that we, we not only change epigenetics with toxins we, uh, for the bad, uh, and, but we can in, in improve epigenetics. Exercise, for example, will change histone modification and DNA motiv um, um, methylation uh, and, and give us very important uh, benefit, uh, including angiogenesis, muscular tone, uh, uh, stem cells, energy, and reduce risk of several diseases. Um, the same thing with fasting, uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, many factors that change when, when, when we fast over 16, 18, 20, 30 hours. And one, one of them very important is the mitochondrial biogenesis. We include, we, we increase uh, mitochondrial energy. And with that, there's other uh, epigenetics that will improve autophagy, uh, stem cell functionality and reduce inflammation. Uh, also the epigenetic diet, there are certain chemicals and certain uh, foods that will have a very important epigenetic influence uh, and, and uh, go directly to curcumin, uh, uh, catechins, resveratrol, lycopene, sulforaphane, genistein, vitamin A and acetylene. All those change uh, DNA methyltransferase, uh, curcumin, histone deacetylase, and and uh, and sulforaphane also affects human uh, telomerase. By, by the way, I love using broccoli sprouts because they have like a hundred times more uh, sulforaphane that you can find in broccoli. So nu nutrition uh, gives you micronutrients and macronutrients and micronutrients uh, and phytochemicals uh, in the food uh, and in, in some other uh, forms of uh, plant medicine will, will uh, have some profound botanical uh, activity, uh, biological activity. And, and it will, it, it can serve also as medicine. It can be an anti-inflammatory, it can affect platelet aggregation, antioxidant, cell communication, energy, and so on. And we, we, we shall not forget about the importance of feeding the microbiome, uh, which, which means we cannot afford to eat well. And that means your veggies and, and uh, and uh, fibers that will nourish the microbiome. I am putting here is that, that the epigenetics is not just uh, eating or fasting, doing exercise, taking nutrients or anything. Uh, meditation and, and behavior also affects uh, epigenetics. And I, I'm putting some reference there. Sleep deprivation, that's why we, we need to sleep well. If we don't sleep well, we'll, we'll damage uh, our uh, so genome, in, uh, the expression of the genome in a way that, uh, you know, methylation, uh, uh, microRNA and, and DNA methylation is affected. And that will have a very important inflammatory cytokine response. It will damage endothelial function, 
uh, you will produce cardiovascular disease, oxidative damage, and so on. So therefore, if a, if a doctor doesn't address this correctly, it cannot help the patient because in the sleep is when you regenerate. Uh, a, a couple of people mentioned before uh, the, 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 that health is not just uh, uh, an absence of infirmity, but also it's a dynamic state of physical, mental, spiritual, and social. So I just put this to quote spirituality. Uh, it it gives us a sense of connection to something higher than ourselves, uh, a, a sense of interconnectedness that involves meaning of life and might be perceived as transient. And I had a hunch that this group will connect to that and I can see it is because you have such a passion. So that I had to put this, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's this good energy that kind of bring us together. So in summary, we have a diet, all these elements that are, are necessary. And, and it, look, it's a nutrient quality, quantity, and timing. And timing means that you are able to, to, to rest from eating and, and maybe not eating in a day or two, that's fasting. And then uh, exercise, very, very important. You have to do it. And also rest, you have to do it. There are some other te techniques that, that may be able to help because you, you might need some alignment of the spine and, and some other massage and things like that. And of course, let's not forget about breathing and, and, and being conscious and meditating and, 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 and enhance our spirit and recreate and love and be connected to nature. Uh, the, the methodology I mentioned earlier has to do with, uh, you know, um, making a, a history, a medical, a, a physical examination, uh, an assessment, and, and very, very important lab testing. And, and look, we, we, when we do look into the lab testing, like, like Kooning, <laughs> that's why I was laughing, because Kooning was saying many things that, that I had over here. We're family. We just don't know, we didn't know. So this lab testing, nutrient, inflammation, hormone, metabolism, epigenome, microbiome, toxins, and then make a personalized uh, therapy plan. And of course, we're meant to be uh, like, uh, not just uh, like uh, a healer, we're also a teacher, a co-learner. So, so people have to know why so that they can incorporate those things. So everything is energy. That's all that there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality and you want and you cannot help but get reality. It cannot be another way. This is not philosophy, it's physics. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy frequency and vibration. And unconditional love is the most powerful stimulant of the immune system. Truth is love healed. That was by Bernie Siegel uh, in the book, Love, Medicine and Miracles. Thank you for the opportunity and I'm done. Wonderful, Dr. Jorge, really uh, bouncing a perfect segue off of uh, uh, Greg Cunion. Um, Len, I think you got a, a good follow-up coming uh, to what you've just delivered, Jorge. Um, Len Saputo uh, was introduced to us by uh, Greg Cunion and uh, had, a, had a wonderful time getting to know Len doing the research. and. Uh, so he's here today, and uh, he's an integrative path PC, medical director, MD, and he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's an MD, health medicine forum founder, health medicine center founder, medical director. Uh, his topic, spiritual aspects 
of COVID-19. He's going to drive home some very serious points. Um, again, thank you, uh, Jorge. Uh, welcome you, Glenn, Dr. Saputo. Uh, you can take it from here. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jorge, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed your talk. That was beautiful. And I, I, I like the way you ended it. And I'm going to start from the backside and move forward on that because I, I'm really interested in the role of spirit and healing. And a lot of that comes from my dear friend, Richard Cunyon. And it chokes me up to remember all the wonderful times we had together. We were soulmates in so many ways. I, I, he was my brother. We'd have long conversations on the phone. We, we couldn't do it in less than about an hour. And we'd talk about everything. And spirituality was certainly a large part of that. It's interesting that, that Dick was really into that sort of thing. He's a psychiatrist, you have to remember. And he turned internist on me. And I'm an internist who probably turned psychiatry, but beyond that, because I think the role of spirit and healing is enormous. <coughs> We did things like go out to dinner. We'd play golf together. We'd, we'd talk about Rumi when we played golf. Uh, it was the kind of thing that built a relationship that was uh, sacred. And our relationships are sacred. And we have to remember that we get all intermixed with science and, and how different it is from spirituality. And we've lost a lot of what, what, what happened 400 years ago. And we, and we haven't been whole in our thinking since that time is when Descartes came along and talked about science and relegated the role of spirit back to the church. It was a big, big mistake because it simply eliminated probably the most, not probably, the most important thing in my mind that runs our lives and gets us on track. We have to remember we're social beings. We need one another. We need to look at, at, at who we are and what's important. And when we do that, we go a level deeper because I've practiced medicine for 55 years now. I'm 81 years old and I'm at the peak of my life from that point of view. And I don't ever let the role of spirit leave my mind. I live that way. I meditate that way. Life is a meditation when I'm doing it properly. And I think the kinds of things that we do in medicine have taken us away from that. And so we're missing a really important part. In fact, medicine, in my opinion, shouldn't be resuscitated, it should be reinvented. We're like a massive battleship going down a river and we're trying to change things and it won't change because it's too big, it's too massive. And it has so many special interest groups that are going in different directions that we have to come back to knowing who we are as individuals we have to remember that health is a service and it's, it's, and it's a business today. The heart and soul of medicine has been gutted. It claims to be, but is not science-based. So what is it? It's a business. And relegating the role of spirit back to the church was a huge, huge mistake. So we have to remember uh, who we are. We have to Take this opportunity now that we have with COVID being upon us to do the things that we have to, to understand it in a different way. We've never had this opportunity for spiritual growth and to come together as one as we have now. So I feel blessed to live at a time when uh, we're looking at a one world order, which is scaring the bejesus out of me. And it, and it, and it's, and it's happening. Uh, it's uh, we're, we're at a risk for losing our democracy. And a lot of it's our fault. Uh, it's because of the way the culture has developed or we have flawed cultural values. Uh, we seem to think that material wealth supersedes spiritual wealth. Should we take that blue pill that we, we, we talked about in the matrix or are we gonna wake up and try and do something to change things? We don't realize, but we're in World War III right now. Uh, they're not shots uh, or bombs going on. There's the possibility of subjugation and extinction nonetheless. Uh, and the, the perpetrators are geniuses, they're, but they're psychopaths. And they're into this lockstep arrogance. Uh, it's led to our complacency and denial that there's even a problem. 
I like what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says when he talks about what's happened in the last year. He says, after fighting and dying for 200, uh, 200 years ago and sustaining the best we can, our democracy, we've given it away in just a year because of one lying doctor. We all know who he is. It's created a global psychosis that doesn't deal with science. Well, what she, we have is, well, well, of she, course, who else would it be? It. Yeah, and he's got some seconds it. behind him. Yeah, well, he's Fauci is. He's got a government behind him. Well, he's a he's got crimes against humanity, as so many people do, that are in that era. So, we've fallen for things like a, a PCR test, which is faulty, with mortality rates that are stats that are way out of bounds, and vaccine mandates that have caused us to lose our civil liberties and businesses. Uh, we've returned to fiat money. We've lost our democracy. Uh, and we have a government dependency. Now people are out of work because we're giving stimulus checks to them. Uh, this is a global, a global coup for a benign illness like a flu with tons of propaganda that's incessant, with censor censorship that keeps us from being able to say our piece, and biological weapons that are tearing us apart. This is literally a Holocaust that's spiritual as well as in every other way. We were maybe dying from shots from gun, guns 200 years ago. Now we're dying from shots from syringes. And, and why have we gone along with all the loss of civil liberties? And we've, we've stopped treatments that work. Uh, it's against the law for me to prescribe ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine to try and treat a disease that's so easy to treat. And the vaccine is used as a weapon for our kids who don't even need it when 99.997% of them survive with no, with no treatment. In fact, under the age of 20, those are the statistics that are real, real. And yet a vaccine that causes all kinds of problems, uh, lots of mortality and and hundreds of thousands of people are having so-called side effects. The, the intent of this could be nothing but depopulation. And, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, the world is, uh, is falling apart in that way. We have to do something to resuscitate our, our medical system. You know, when we talk about science and spirituality. I like what Einstein said in a quote that I'll paraphrase. He says, basically the job of the physicist is to try and understand uh, how the cosmos works and to use it by, by using logic and science and math. Then he goes on to say, good luck. The only way we can know about these things because we'll never understand what they are is through our intuition and I'll add imagination and dream time to, uh, to, to know about what the universe is. So I've practiced medicine now for a long time as I said, 55 years. And the things I've learned in that time is that medicine is powerful and wonderful and we need it. There's no question that we've made advances that are unbelievable. But yet, as Jorge was saying, uh, we haven't progressed that much in terms of solving the diseases that we see. And we have to take some kind of action to do things in a different way. I feel like and I believe that man was made in God's image. We have human limits that are rescues, rescued by the God within us. The inner voice is what speaks to us. It's the trust and faith that we have. If it's strong, that means we have nothing to fear. And the suffering that goes along with this has a prize. And that prize is wisdom. Now that we know what's happening, it's important for us to take action that's different. Uh, and even though we've made the progress that we have, we're, we have still deteriorated uh, because we aren't the patriots that our forefathers were. The fear, the complacency, the depression, the hopelessness uh, has had a huge effect on our culture. Uh, and MDs have been censored. There's misinformation out there. Uh, and the medical boards are coming after us for doing the things that are right. And we have to remember that our higher order is, is not the laws of this country. It's the laws of God. It's, it's the laws of Hippocrates. 
when I look at the role of spirit in, in, in our lives, what I believe is my opinion, and I've learned to look at illness in a different way, and I'm not really asking you to agree with me. I'm only asking that you listen with an open mind and then decide for yourself if there's substance and value to what I'm proposing. And what I want to share is far different than what I learned in medical school. And I've integrated that in my practice to the point where it now re has replaced the lion's share of how I work with my patients. It's how I live my life because that's how I believe in things. My experience as the founder and director of the Health Medicine Forum includes moderating more than 300 events over 15 years and has opened my eyes to the fact that there's a wide range of healing modalities in addition to mainstream medicine. Many of these have been around for thousands of years and they work and they have the ability to add a lot to helping people that are sick. I've come to believe that if all healers would take time to study these disciplines as I have, they, they would welcome many of them as mainstream treatments. Many of these disciplines have a lot in common and they, and they honor the role of spirit in their work and in their lives, especially the shamans of the world. In fact, spirituality is a central theme in most of them. It's clear to me that there's an intricate organization and incredible perfection in how the universe operates, so much so that it boggles my mind, especially when it comes to illness. And this is what's missing in medicine today. Because the more I've thought about the workings of the universe and health and disease, the more I've become impressed with that every aspect of a person's dance with illness unfolds in a way that has meaning and value. I've observed so many instances where my patient's illness has had an impact far beyond its social, uh, physical disabilities and psychological challenges that I've come to expect that there is always 100% of the time a deeper meaning that's an integral part of the illness. It's not we're at the wrong place at the wrong time or that we have a micronutrient deficiency or some other kind of problem that's easy for us to look at when we look at the medical system, which I don't wanna put down. I wanna honor, especially when we're looking at orthomolecular medicine. But I now look for this, this hidden significance whenever I'm working with my patients or for that matter in everything that happens in my life. I believe that it's our intuition, imagination, and dream time that come into play that provides us with our inner voice that when it resonates within, guides us to new ideas and to do what is right. This is just simple common sense. I believe that if we have sufficient trust and faith in God, that he's taking care of us and that every living and every living thing in the universe as well we have nothing to fear. We may suffer from what unfolds in our life because we do. Life is full of suffering. But at the same time, this is how we learn in ways that would not be possible had we not experienced the suffering, the disease or the disability. And the prize is wisdom. When I remember that God has taken care of me, I speak up and I do the right thing. The more painful thing is to hold back. Then the real suffering comes on because if I know that there's something that's important and I'm not doing what I could, I feel I can't sleep at night. The bottom line for me is to have trust and faith in God's will, especially when I don't understand what's happening, which happens so often, but then we're not God. So how can we expect to know what God is doing and for what reasons? I think prayer is important too, but I also believe that while God's my partner, he also expects me to take a lot of responsibility in dealing with difficult issues that are in my life the best I can. He takes care of those people who take care of themselves, meaning we have to do our part too. Now, physicians are bound by a higher order. We have national, state, and local laws that govern the land, but we also have a higher order that comes from, from God's rule. The Hippocratic, Hippocratic Oath is certainly talking about a lot of that. Before starting a medical practice, physicians should take an oath that supersedes all other law, and we do. And according to that oath, physicians are required to provide treatment, and when indicated, of course, do no harm. But we've forgotten a lot of that. And Dr. George, 
the beautiful way that you explained this is so clear and I just, I honor, I honor that. I believe that this oath is in accordance with God's expectations. So is it time to bring spirituality back into the world and back into medical practice? It's well known that there's very little good science in clinical medicine. The kind of things that are presented in this conference are good medicine, but the conflicts of interest that are connected to the financial matters, especially from big pharma, who has the lion's share of supporting the research industry has taken precedence over good science. Big pharma spends way too much money. They're spending in the range of 10 years ago when I studied this, $92 billion or towards research. The National Institutes of Health only spent 32 billion. So what we're looking at is a business in medical research. And I've gotten to the point where when I read my journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Journal of American uh, Medical Association, I almost get sick. The stuff I see in there is, is so much garbage. And this has been studied and don't, don't take my word for it. Take the word from the Office of Technology uh, that, that looked at this. Take the word from the publications, even in the, in the Journal of the American Medical Association and in uh, the British Medical Journal uh, years ago. When they analyzed this and they said, how much good medicine is there in the practice uh, or that's using good science? That number came up with something that shocked me because when I talked to my colleagues, I thought, well, we, we really are scientists and we're, we're solving all kinds of problems with, with truth that you, you can't deny. And when I heard that 85% of what we did wasn't good science because only 15% was according to these three groups, it blew my mind. And then when I looked at the amount of good science that there is in medical research that's published in our major journals, it blew me away. You're looking at 1% of that and, and why? It's because who's doing the research? Do you think Big Pharma is going to spend $500 million on a study and then come out and say, don't buy this product because it's no good? They do everything in their power because why they're a business and they're responsible to the stockholders. And that's where it comes in that medicine is, is not science-based. It's, it's based on a business that's it's supporting its stockholders. There has never been a study that compares the number of people whose lives are saved by the practice of medicine with the number of people who have died because of their treatment. And, and that study that, that Jorge just presented from Gary Null, I know a lot about because I was in the film called Death, Death by Medicine. And in fact, I had a big role in it. And I was so impressed with what Gary did because there are more deaths caused by iatrogenic disease than there are by any other, any individual disease. One of the shortest problems or one of the biggest problems that we see that has the worst shortcomings in a medical training is that doctors are not trained in holistic medicine. We don't learn about spirituality. I remember when I was back at Duke and what they were telling me was be a scientist, be detached from your patients, don't get connected with them, don't do anything social. And I was thinking, what the hell are you telling me? That's the most ridiculous thing of all time. If I don't know you and know what's, what, what's in your soul, how am I gonna give you advice about the right thing to do? And if you don't know me and I can't be honest with you and open and have you ask the questions that you want, how is this relationship gonna work? So I don't practice the way I was trained anymore because I don't believe in it. I think there is a place for it, but it's not the big place. When we gave, the role of spirit back to the church 400 years ago, we made a fatal decision. It doesn't make much sense to discard the most important part of medicine just because scientists don't know what to do with spirituality or because it's not taught in medical school. Sadly, HMO medicine has, has, has been content to get us back on our feet and back to work. While there's value to the quick fix, there's also much more value in deeping in, in, in looking at the deeper spiritual roots of what the underlying cause for disease is. Now, if you want to go to the deepest roots, I'm sorry, they're not orthomolecular, they're spiritual. And then the end result is that we learned the biochemistry that camouflages what's gone wrong 
And in the process, we take great risk in doing some of the things we do, even when it comes to supplementation. When I look at a metabolic pathway chart, it drives me wild. There are thousands of reactions on there. And I wonder what I'm doing when I put a little more vitamin C or a little D or some other nutrient that I know helps conditions that I want to treat. What does it do to the rest of the body? If you want to look at the real issues that are going on, you've got to go back and you've got to see what the spiritual if reasons for being ill are. And I, I try to do that in my practice now, and it means more listening, more caring, more loving. It's about sharing and giving and loving and building community with everybody who comes to see me, because I believe it's, it's our soul that's involved here. It's that spark of, of spirit that dwells within us that connects us to universal consciousness and provides a mechanism through which we can heal. This is nothing new. Ancient shamans were aware of this thousands of years ago, but it's been forgotten as science has superseded spirituality and medicine. It's time to wake up and go back to the future if we want to move forward. Nowhere is universal organization and perfection more clear than it is in the practice of medicine. Yet, ironically, nowhere has it been more invisible than it is to today's doctors. Our doctors must bear some of this responsibility because they're the ones delivering health care. But the intrinsic defect is not in our doctors. It starts and originates in the healthcare model itself, which of course is a business model. The lion's share of this defect is the way our well-intentioned and highly committed young doctors are being trained to practice medicine. And we have to stop this because the money that's involved and is exchanging hands is enormous. And the pharmaceutical industry is a monster now, even though it saves some lives. And it has a stranglehold on medical institutions, the medical centers of the world, and the rest of, of how we're dealing with, with our world. Uh, and medical practice is no longer controlled by experience and conscience today. The commercial interests out there are controlling how medicine is taught and practiced. So strange as it may seem, most doctors today do have a personal belief in spirituality and many have a strong religious practice. Uh, we go to church on Sundays and we come back on Mondays and we go back to the same thing that we were doing before. We're back in the same thing that we were taught. And because we don't have the courage to step forward on our own, and do what's right, medicines become a business where the bottom line is return on investment, even for the doctor. It's not about service. So despite how our medical training is, doctors still instinctively blend science and spirituality. Fact is, we all do. We depend on our intuition and imagination for new ideas. That's where they come from but we don't have a single clue about how they work or where these ideas come from. Do they come through us? Um, man's pondered this question for millennia with no clear answers. And the bottom line is, we trust that ideas come to us from wherever they originate, and then we do our best to use science to test their validity. Intuition, intuition and science have always been partners. It's easy to appreciate that science and spirituality are each limited and that they can only study something from their own perspective, but their observations and analyses and conclusions would be quite different because their tools and metrics are so different. But bringing these perspectives together helps us to understand more about the, what the different aspects of the universe is telling us, as well as how they might collectively function as a single unified unit, because that's how it was made. And that's what holism is all about. There's no good reason to make science and spirituality enemies when in fact they're intimate, inseparable, and complementary. It's tempting to highlight their differences that gets us in trouble. The challenge is to integrate them into a single principle. Science can, and spirituality also work in, in different ways. Science is reductionistic and spirituality is holistic. And when we bring them together, it gives us a tool that's holistic. 
Now that we have the electron microscope, we can magnify 500,000 times and can see things that we've never seen before. And through science, we know a lot about anatomy of matter and how it works, and it's very valuable, but holism is quite the reverse. It doesn't focus on parts, it focuses on the whole person and how it relates to the oneness of the universe. It reminds me of how a scientist would look at an orange. We can describe it, we can talk about the different kinds of taste that it has, uh, we can get microscopic about it, but you'll never know what an orange is until you eat it. And how are you gonna explain what an orange tastes like? And how are you gonna know what it really does to your body? And yet we have to remember that human nature is to strive to understand how the world works. And we're curious beings and it's fun to try and figure out how we can manipulate mother nature to protect ourselves from things like the extremes in weather. But when it's looking at disease, it's far more complicated. We have Curiosity is a good thing, but we can overdo our curiosity. When we get into our left brain analytical scientific mode, it's easy to become preoccupied and bogged down by innumerable basic questions that have been unanswerable throughout all time and will remain that way if Einstein was right. The more we consume ourselves with attempts to understand the, un the ununderstandable, define the undefinable, and control the uncontrollable, we take away from living our lives. We become experts in unliving our lives. Remember that life is for living. What's clear is that we get overly hung up on things that we'll never understand because we don't and never will know what light is or what gravity is or what any other uh, universal energy is. And a kind of thing that I call analysis paralysis takes over. So what have we learned from all this? When it comes to COVID-19, we can't trust the sources that are giving us information. We have to self-educate. We have to research all points of view. We have to know the science behind it and this fake vaccine. We must never acquiesce to mandates that are illegal, unconstitutional and immoral. We have to recognize that we're in a world war. This is World War III and it's time to be a patriot. And there will be casualties as there always have been in wars. But be a patriot because love always prevails. At the end, it always prevails. Spend your dollars intelligently by boycotting operations that don't support us, but don't support, but do support local businesses. Prepare for the worst scenario. Have plenty of food, water, power, communication, defense, et cetera. And importantly, come together with grassroots and, and have a cooperation of sharing things to survive and protect and to build community. Be part of the great evolution of humanity because that's what we're facing now. Think of the role of spirit in your life now and know why you're here. What's your purpose? What do you, what is your epitaph can say, you're going to say? A lot of the time we're going shoot and then ready aim. Wouldn't it be nice if we know what the goal was and wrote that epitaph early and then stop procrastinating and get off your backside and start taking the action that we need to take now. When you're looking at what wealth is, some of it's how you put your money to work to help build community and to make society sustainable. But most importantly, Put spirituality as the number one and most important aspect of our lives. If we can do this, the whole planet would change. The way we live would, would change. And we would go back to how things were years ago. I can remember back in the 40s and 50s when life was different. It was slower. It was more like life was in Australia, not to mention what life in Australia is today. When we look back at what's happened there, this is a country that's been destroyed. And it breaks my heart to see the people that I know there reaching out and saying, we can't do anything about this. We're going to be in the next boxcar train that goes to Auschwitz if it keeps going like this. So it's time to wake up. Fight for what, we've, what we need as human beings. 
share and give and build community and remember that love is the most powerful energy in the universe. If we can do that, we'll be home safe because God will protect us and always has. If we can trust and have faith in that, that's what it's going to take to get us back on board. And we don't want to forget our orthomolecular roots. I'll never forget my relationship with Richard Cunyon. It's a good place to finish here since we started there. Richard was such an amazing genius in so many ways. But what I loved about Dick was Dick. I mean, what a special, loving man who tried to, to give the world a gift and to teach us about medicine and spirituality. So God bless you, Dick. Rest in peace. And thank you all for having me. Len, even more than I could imagine was my prayer answered. That these meetings we've had would bring the finest people together with the greatest insight into global realities. From the poorest nations on earth to the two richest nations on earth, China and the US. The dynamic imbalances of the earth. Uh, and how, how hard we try to seek balance. Okay. So Pudo, I have a question for you. And I really don't care what the answer is. I'm using you to speak to an audience that we need to become activists. In the 1970, the actual year 1970, when I established the first commercially successful FM radio station on earth, with two other men and change the entire world forever in the next decade. What we did to bring a demographic, a pretty broad-based demographic together was to simply share the truth. All of our rivers are catching fire. If your children swam in Lake Erie, the world's largest, shallowest lake, the number one fishing hole on the face of the earth for freshwater fish, you came out with an infection. I was a kid that came out with an infection. Okay. And when we told the truth about what man's inhumanity to our environment was, we established the cultural revolution and we established the environmental movement. This is the early part of 1970. Now imagine with advocacy, with human beings becoming patriots to protect their environment and literally their children. Did we come together as a community? Earth Day, millions of people coming together. We changed America. Now, when you change America, you're changing the globe. And the environmental movement became the Environmental Protection Agency in December of that year. Never before in government history that we could find in our country, because we did the research then, did a government get pushed into something it didn't want to deal with because it was a part of the corruption. And the part of the corruption was the big money being spent by corporations to shut the government up so they could destroy our environment. The exact same thing is happening right now. Hello. Everyone. And it's not our environment they're killing. It's human beings. The most precious gift God gave us was us. We are it. And thank you, Dr. Saputo, for driving that point home. Okay. Well, there's something now, we still need to do, Jack. Go ahead. It, it, we need to evolve. We're, <laughs> we live a narcissistic life. It's all about I, me, my, and mine. Uh, and we struggle to have material things. Uh, and we measure our success by how much money we have and how much power we have and how important we are. But until we transform into wanting to, to share and give and build community and to make the world a better place, 
and to put others in front of ourselves. We will not make the social transformations that are required to be a loving community that can stand on its own and work together as a unit. And that's where the problem lies. And we have so much fear because of what's happened for, for thousands of thousands of years. We haven't come to a place where what we're looking is our heartfelt driven need to be with people and to love them unconditionally. It's not what we get. It's what we give and what gives us the most in, for our return of, of being on the planet is to help people. That's why we went to medical school. That's why we, we go to church. It's why we live our lives uh, selflessly. These are the things that really matter. And if we don't understand that, we're hopeless. And we're struggling now because we're being divided. And the more groups we have and, and the further we're divided, the more difficult it's going to be to try and come together without the development of community, without unconditional love, without supporting one another, it's hopeless. We're done. Humanity will be finished. And these psychopaths that are trying to control our lives, these people like Anthony Fauci, are a vexation to my spirit. God bless this group. I think we get it. And if we can move on together and support each other the way we're all suggesting, the world will be a better place. Dr. Uh, Saputo, your, your wisdom doesn't stop here. It's a river that's going to keep on being heard because I'm going to do something about making sure you're heard. Like I've worked very hard to pull off these last two days. Okay. And what I know I can do with communications being a global broadcaster. I'm the father of FM radio from a commercial sense. Okay. Now I was giving you the example of what happened with the, the environmental envir attacks by man's inhumanity to man and corporate interests taking over government with money. Pharmaceutical companies have taken over government and education with money. At the end of the day, we are dealing with not the destruction of our environment. That's what they did 50 years ago. Now I'm in the epicenter of dealing with the end of human lives for profit. Okay, brought to us by corporations, specifically pharmaceutical corporations. Now, I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Len Saputo, are you a member of NHS? I'm not actually. I didn't know okay, that much. Doctor, about. doctor, doctor. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that we deal with globally in this regard, because we need sacrifice. We need patriots. Here's how I was raised. My children are raised like this, but I find so few people anywhere that I talk to that I deal with because I'm a, I'm an outgoing. I'm a completely insane seventy five year old. And I have no limits to what I can think and what I can deliver as long as I'm delivering only one thing consistently. I feel blessed. I get a blessing. The first thing I have to do with it is give it away, get rid of it, get it to someone who can use it. I, I figure, well, if I do that, guess what's going to happen? The cup gets filled up another blessing arrives. And then you got to deal with getting rid of that one and giving it to people. And it becomes spectacular. Okay. Spectacular in sharing unconditional love because God puts people in front of you. And our job is, well, guess what? You got to love every single one of them, but you don't have to like them. Now, here we go. I want you to to, to promise me, I beg you, Dr. Saputo, we need you. And every human being, we need every human being that can afford like $43 uh, that could go into the National Health Federation. www.the
Well, it's interesting, isn't it? How things play out. Well, I will join. <laughs> Greg, you, you see to it that I get the forms, huh? <laughs> Don't worry. Don't, you're not on the spot here, Len. We'll, we'll get it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness that was uh that was a great comic moment <laughs> beautiful lecture beautiful beautiful presentation Len. so glad you could be here with us and join us today uh <laughs> well i'm not i'm not sure where that leaves us right now but my guess is uh jack will probably be here at any minute <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, you know, I, I have is there, to say, a, is there a network glitch in his end or I, I just don't know. Yeah, who, who knows? I, I have to tell you, you know, it's very interesting. And I, I, of course, I didn't touch on it today. But, you know, my, my father, uh, you know, is a, was a philosopher as well. And he developed a protocol and a philosophy known as the inner smile. And one of these days, we're going to have to continue this. I, in fact, for those who are interested, I will, I will tell you this. Um, my family and I went through a hell of a tragedy in, in 1980, when three weeks after I graduated from high school, my eight and a half year old brother was in a very freak accident. And he was killed by his best friend, a nine year old boy who picked up a golf club and hit my brother in the base of the neck by accident and, and killed my brother. And at 17, uh, there was an, a, an overload of testosterone running through me and a great deal of uh, stress and, and anxiety and question as to, of course, why me, what kind of world would do this? How could God allow this to happen? And uh, I have a, a brief talk about this it's somewhere on my Facebook page where I talk about it. I, I uh, you know, I feel very blessed to actually carry this around with me and to feel my brother at every moment of my life. And the fact that I feel even more blessed that my father gave me this gift. And in fact, I talked about it recently after my dad died and how the inner smile has been a guiding force for me. And uh, my dad would actually instill that on every patient he had. There was that little itty bitty piece of psychiatry, psychiatrist left in him that he would convey these messages with and uh, his philosophy of gold plan lesson and the inner smile was definitely a major part of it. And I think it's absolutely true. You know, there's so, there's so many connections here. We were I was chatting just a, a moment or two ago with Nick about the philosophy of Tai Chi and energy and the connection and how that has also been such a grounding and important part of, of, of my psyche as well. And it's just, it, it, it's, 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 it's wonderful to see all these elements being brought together and having the openness to be able to discuss these kinds of things and that they're not mutually exclusive. You know, it is so funny how the scientific world can get so lost in it that it's, it's, it's just this and we get so myopic when in fact there's a much bigger picture. And so I just, I'm just very touched. I'm so happy that I reached out to you, Len, and got you to be a participant in this and that you, know, you were able to be gracious enough and, and help us and participate with us. It's, uh, it, it's, it's very encouraging. And when I see a group like this get together, I am actually feeling very upbeat and positive because I know that there is hope and I know that there is an awareness and an energy out there that this like energy is coming together and uh, we, we will overcome. <laughs> yeah, there's a resonance that's very powerful. You know, it, yes. it reminds me of a story uh, your dad told me about Tony. He said that at the age eight, Tony summed up everything. He said, dad, life is for living, you know. Yes, and, and my father said that when he asked that question, he was surprised because my brother was uh, somewhat asleep in the back of the car. And my, my father said, you know, his philosophy was that the, the meaning of death is infinity. Oh, well. Wow. And so I've been uh, very, very blessed, you know, especially that these has been an unusual experience because, uh, you know, my, my father and I were connected uh, by the hip, you know, and I, I was very fortunate to have that relationship with, with my dad. And so 
I, I experience it. I'm having conversations with my dad on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, but I yeah. promised I, I promised myself I wouldn't break down to this <laughs> land. Can I, can I request you, uh, Gregory, can I request you to continue the panel? Because I guess Jack's computer died. So oh, his not... computer died. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little I'm a little confused here, so maybe you guys can help me. Dan, are you are you speaking next? I'm ready to go. Oh, well then, in, in that case, uh, a member of the board of directors of the National Health Federation, Dan Kenner, uh, who has an illustrious background, career, and, and a great writer, and uh, also a good friend. Uh, Dan, I, let me turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to put my screen up there. <clears throat> so I'm grateful for this uh, opportunity to present. I um, been inspired by the presentations that I've heard so far, and I'm, I'm grateful to Jack Creation, wherever he is, for, for helping make this possible. But uh, my presentation is based on my conviction that uh, we all know what's wrong. We know that, that uh, pharmaceutical companies have too much power and, and that uh, there are a lot of problems uh, with medicine today and, and throughout society. But uh, I want to bring more of a positive message because my conviction is that if people knew what is available, what could be available for their health care, then there would be demand for it. And I think that the way that we can change things most quickly is through the marketplace. We can march in the streets, we can launch lawsuits and, and, and all of that. But, um, but I think if there's public demand for natural medicine services, for things that, that do no harm, then that's the way that we can beat, um, we can overcome the empire and, and Darth Vader. So the Ormed Educational Foundation plans to produce a series of educational and documentary videos on a lot of these topics that, uh, that I want to present. Uh, I call it, Dr. Saputo calls it healing medicine. I call it healing science. I think that medicine's okay the way it is, but medicine doesn't do healing. If you take blood pressure medication, you take it for the rest of your life. If you have diabetes, you take insulin for the rest of your life. If they give you statins, you take them for the rest of your life. But natural medicine is about correction, correcting problems that are wrong whenever, whenever possible. Um, so conventional medicine manages illness and attempts to relieve symptoms, but healing science is corrective. Of course, we have to start with orthomolecular medicine. And I think uh, Everyone's familiar with, with these three people. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Dr. Richard Cunyan. I only uh, met him, I think, uh, three different times. And each time I, I felt that uh, I had been uh, blessed with a, a spiritual presence and uh, truly a great healer as well as a great uh, intellectual. His mind was just so nimble and active. Everyone knows that scurvy was a vitamin C deficiency disease. There are other problems that can be solved with uh, nutritional medicine that are, that are equally severe. For example, there was an epidemic of pellagra. After food companies began to refine rice and to refine wheat, there was a deficiency of B vitamins. And with a deficiency of B1, there was beriberi. With a deficiency of B3, there was pellagra. The symptoms of pellagra are indistinguishable from schizophrenia. And a number of cases of full-blown schizophrenia have been reversed simply by providing niacin, vitamin B3. So we can't underestimate how powerful nutritional and, and particularly orthomolecular medicine are. So the topic, my title is Past, Present, and Future Healing Science. So I want to talk about the golden age of healing science, which was over 120 years ago. Homeopathy was widespread in the late 1800s and up until about uh, 1930. There were over 100 homeopathic hospitals, more than 1,000 homeopathic pharmacies, and 22 homeopathic medical schools. Homeopathic psychiatry flourished during this time. 
this Middletown State Homeopathic Hospital was uh, was a renowned hospital that was devoted to uh, psychiatric treatment. The widow of Abraham Lincoln, Mary Todd Lincoln, was effectively treated with homeopath with homeopathy at what they called a sane asylum. So. Homeopathy is not placebo medicine. It was very successful in treating and preventing smallpox. It got its reputation in Europe during a cholera epidemic. It got its reputation in America uh, during a yellow fever epidemic. And the homeopathic doctors themselves were, were often intellectuals who were willing to do years of extra study in order to become more accomplished healers. They were instrumental in developing what we know now today as double-blind placebo-controlled uh, research. You can see here's, here's one research study that was done, but there are other uh, research studies that have been done on sepsis. On Dan, I, I don't, yeah. don't mean to interrupt, but are you trying to show slides right now? Yeah, can't you see them? No, I, I think what's happened is you've got to select the share content and make sure you click on broadcast it. And then there, there you go. go. There. Sorry about that. Oh boy, thanks for interrupting me. Okay, now I, I don't seem to have control of it. Oh, here we go. Okay. I'm going to start at the beginning and do the 90 mile an hour version healing science past, present, and future. How we plan to, to produce educational and documentary videos, how healing science is different from medical science. Here are the fathers of orthomolecular medicine. And then here's a picture of Middletown State Homeopathic Hospital in New York, 1901. And this is the one about how homeopathy is not placebo medicine. This is a study with, with uh, lung cancer patients. But there are other studies that were done with things like um, sepsis, sept septic shock, um, kidney failure that would be harder to attribute to a placebo. And here's a number of other studies that have been shown where homeopathic uh, treatment has been used uh, against a uh, placebo. So German biological medicine came into ascendancy at this time. The Friedman remedy was a very powerful remedy that cured and prevented tens of thousands of cases of tuberculosis up through the 1930s. Friedman himself uh, had to, was uh, put on trial. He was a Jew and the Nazis put him on trial in the 1940s, but he was actually acquitted because his reputation was so strong. And then there were the, the Enderlein remedies, the Spengler-Sahn remedies, the Arthur Kalin remedies, which were remedies made from infected dental pulp and used for treating arthritis and cancer. And here are some of the, the doctors who were leading lights uh, during that era. And then biological dentistry, Holistic dental science is devoted to treating oral and systemic disease by removing toxins, particularly mercury. But an important part of it is treating failed root canals. Failed root canals are treated by extraction and by cavitation. Biological dentistry is, is uh, available today in Germany and Switzerland, but it was in the, uh, the mainstream peer-reviewed literature uh, for a number of years. And it's a, a very important factor because I have a book called The Whole Body Workbook for Cancer. And as a result, I see a lot of cancer patients. And one of the important things I look for is, well, who gets well and who doesn't? Because you see people in stage four that live for, for four or five years and don't seem to be bothered by it. And then there are people at earlier stages that die within a few weeks. Some of the factors I think are, are old trauma Another factor is uh, inflammation, how much inflammation is generalized in the body. But then one thing that people don't often look for are the, uh, the dental problems, the focal infections. And if those don't get treated, even though they may not be the cause of the cancer, they can be a reason why it doesn't clear up. Here's a doctor who cured cancer. William Coley has been called the father of immunology, but not for this reason. He developed a serum made from Streptococcus pyogenes and used it to induce a bacterial infection in cancer patients. 
and we're talking about cancer patients with, with um, metastasis all over the body, it would completely reverse in many cases. And this has been observed numerous times in the 19th century. We don't see this kind of spontaneous remission so much today because antibiotics usually uh, put away the bacterial infection before it can have a chance to do this. But uh, Coley's toxins, also called Coley's fluid, were purchased by Park Davis and, uh, in 1930 and then effectively shelved. But it seems like every decade or so, a new generation of researchers rediscovers it. And even uh, in as recent as 10 years ago, there's been research at the uh, University of British Columbia on the use of Coley's fluid uh, for treating cancer. Now, by the turn of the 20th century, electromagnetic devices were in widespread use in hospitals and clinics from the late 19th century in Europe, in Canada, and the US. Nikola Tesla was a designer of high-frequency electro electrotherapy equipment and himself a witness to the benefits of this approach. He developed in particular oscillators dedicated to electrotherapy and manufactured them from his factory in the United States. Tesla said, you see, electricity gives a body what it needs, the strength to live, nervous stamina. It's a great doctor, I assure you, maybe the greatest of doctors. In 1932, the American Congress of Physical Therapy in New York recognized the exceptional effectiveness of Tesla oscillators with highly beneficial results in the treatment of cancer, surpassing anything that traditional surgery could accomplish, in the court. Here's a book from 1890 that I obtained called Practical Electricity with, as you can see, a, a detailed description of how to reduce uterine myoma, fibroid tumors, using only electricity and explaining, of course, that it's much less dangerous than resorting to surgery. And in the same book, Dr. Overall reports some of the other types of illnesses that have been successfully treated with this method. Here's another book in 1903. This is also written for other practitioners, high frequency currents. In this case, we're talking about electromagnetic wave therapy. And I thought it was interesting that it seemed that the doctors um, who used this type of therapy agreed that diabetes was one of the most responsive types of, of uh, diseases to this type of treatment. But here are some other conditions that were successfully treated with this method including the bottom malignant growth, rectal prolapse, anal, anal fissure, hemorrhoids, anemia, pulmonary tuberculosis. You can see the list. Here are some of the devices that were used. The comfortable looking chairs where they would put people and irradiate them with, a, with high frequency electromagnetic radiation for 20, 30 minutes at a time. Then there was Russian scientist George Lakovsky, who published a paper in 1925 explaining that he felt that these cell oscillations could uh, cure cancer. I don't know if he was aware of, of uh, Tesla's work because he was from Russia and he was living in France. And I don't know how well uh, international communication was about these things. But um, Lakovsky eventually met Tesla in uh, 1940, after he had arrived in the United States. And it was near the time when uh, Tesla, I think, passed away. But uh, they traded notes on using high-frequency oscillations. The multi-wave oscillator was used in France, Austria, Italy, and New York at Cedar sinai Hospital. Mainly it was indicated for pain, but there were many reports of tumor regressions. Then there's the story of Royal Reif, who developed a light microscope that could see viruses. With the light microscope, he identified microbes and uh, found frequencies that would destroy the microbes with a plasma wave generator called the Reif machine in 1936. The story of Reif is, uh, is a tragic one, as are some of these. Not all of the doctors who cured cancer were, were crucified, but um, Coley wasn't, and uh, others weren't, which we'll see shortly. Then there were the Koch remedies. Dr. William Koch, who I think was actually the nephew of Robert Koch, who developed Koch's principles of 
microbiology and, and infection. And he developed medications that were very effective for treating cancer, for tuberculosis, for chronic infections, and had a host of experts testifying for him before the FDA, but he was denied permission to, to uh, commercialize the products in the United States and was offered a free laboratory in Brazil, so moved to Rio de Janeiro, where he finished his life. Then post-World War II, conditions changed. Industrialized food supply, industrialized food production, quote unquote scientific medicine with toxic and synthetic wonder drugs. Foods and medicines that are natural were attacked and ridiculed. Chemical and pharmaceutical companies were effectively deregulated. There was the emergence of the cholesterol myth, the chemotherapy and radiation myth, vaccine medicine, and an explosion of chronic disease, mental illness, and drug addiction. And then we're told the water's not safe, the food's not safe, don't breathe the air during a pandemic, and stay away from the sunshine, it'll give you cancer. Now here's another doctor who cured cancer. Dr. Gerson was renowned in Germany for his work with dietary therapies. And he published uh, in peer-reviewed journals in the 1930s, but he also felt forced to leave Nazi Germany. Albert Schweitzer, the Nobel laureate and great humanitarian, considered him to be the greatest genius of the age, or the greatest medical genius of the age. Here are some other natural cancer therapies. Hyperthermia. Hyperthermic therapies, classically defined as elevated temperatures applied locally, regionally, or the whole body, are routinely utilized in current medical practice in cancer therapies in Germany. But heat can also be good for arthritis, for muscle spasms, weight control. And uh, I visited a clinic in um, Germany called the um, um, Clinic St. George south of Munich in the, the lake region there. And they had a two week program for treating Lyme disease. And when I was visiting there, the place was filled up with Australians who had seen a video uh, about the treatment of Lyme disease using hyperthermia. hyperthermia. And there was an exodus of, of uh, or an influx of Australians who were in uh, Germany to get this treatment. Other cancer therapies include ozone, which is a powerful antioxidant. It improves circulation, it's a pain reliever. It improves tissue oxygenation, it stimulates the immune system. Now, I've worked with a doctor who, well, I've worked with doctors in Germany uh, where I've sent them cancer patients for hyperthermia and seen them come back without their prostate cancer and without their liver cancer, uh, but in uh, California, I've been working with a doctor who uses ozone treatment, and the ozone treatment is intravenous, even though it can be administered by other routes. And patients who have bad cases of cancer often buy a device and use it at home two or three times a week for, for rectal insufflation and do their own sort of uh, intravenous ozone therapy. And once again, it's not just a cancer treatment. It's good for lots of things including uh, chronic uh, viral infections. Other cancer therapies include intravenous treatments. My experience has mainly been with uh, venous flytrap. I visited a clinic in Germany and spent about a week there and was impressed with uh, the results because I was able to speak to a lot of uh, patients who had had late stage pancreatic cancer. Of course, they, they did lifestyle changes, and they, there were other parts of the treatment, but the intravenous venous flytrap was the, the center of the uh, therapy, and uh, patients came back to America and took it orally and gave themselves intramuscular injections of it as, as a follow-up. Other ones in China, uh, COIX, called Yi Yi Ren in Chinese, has been used intravenously. Greater Selendine is called Ukraine. I think it's still available in Austria, but it's, uh, you know, there's a movement to get rid of these things uh, by, the, uh, by mainstream medicine. Mistletoe is uh, fairly well established in Germany as an anti-cancer treatment. Amygdalin, which is also known as Laetrile, is also available uh, in Europe. And in Southeast Asia, turmeric and ginger have also been used intravenously for, for treating cancer and uh, other chronic diseases. 
Here's some post-World War II electromagnetic, electronic, and light therapies. This is the Priore device, which was developed in the 1960s. It's a gigantic glass tube filled with plasma that uh, generated scalar waves. The Priore team cured terminal tumors, and his scientific advisor says, you know, you can't go around curing cancer, you'll get us all killed. So they set up a study for infecting test animals with sleeping sickness, which is trypanosomiasis, and which is more than just going to sleep, it's a fatal disease and a very deadly disease to humans. And they were able to cure these test animals and felt like they weren't stepping on anyone's toes. Of course, there were human uh, recoveries too, but this was all done under the radar. The Priore project was funded by the French government at one point, but they got, they used $50,000 worth of French money to build a giant tube for it, which was in this uh, device that you can see on the screen here. And it blew up and the French government said, we're not giving you guys any more money. And so it kind of faded out. Now I went to, to uh, Europe a few years ago and I was looking for a Priori device and I went through my network to see if I could find one. And I did, I found a, um, a doctor in Aix-en-Provence, which is by coincidence where I used to live when I was a student years ago in, in college uh, for a year. This doctor was a psychiatrist and he said that he had a Priore device and I took a video of it. And he said that the French equivalent of the FCC shut him down because when he turned the thing on, he was blowing out televisions and computers for about a, a one kilometer radius. But he decided to use this device instead, which runs on, a, I think on a nine volt battery to scale our wave healing device Scalar waves are a special type of electromagnetic energy that's more compatible with the human energy field. The purpose of it is to load, let me go back up, you, there's an antenna where you can load remedies, herbs, drugs, homeopathic remedies. You can run Mozart through there and put any kind of information you want in the field. In this case, the person sits in a chair between them, but the doctor that I visited in Aix-en-Provence put it at either end of the treatment table. And um, most of the, some of the doctors use acupuncture uh, while they have uh, the patient in the scalar field. But the idea is that you can transmit information, chemical information without the actual chemicals. And that chemical reactions actually take place because the electron shells interact with each other, not because little balls called atoms stick together. It's really an interaction of waves that causes a chemical reaction. And this is um, reproduced with uh, the scalar wave. So it would be possible to take an expensive drug and crush it and put it on the antenna and administer it every day with just uh, one pill. So frequencies of biochemicals have also been transmitted in experimental animal models. And they could, frequencies could be used diagnostically to detect pathogenic microbes, malignant tumors, and even pathogens like prions for which there's no reliable method. And parasites can be both detected and eliminated using photobiotherapy, which we'll come to in a minute. Let's go there right now. Um, photobiotherapy is light therapy effective for chronic pain, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. And it happens that the Dr. Saputo who just uh, presented is an expert on this type of therapy and other things too, of course, but perhaps he's one of the leading experts on photobiotherapy. And it's good for a lot of things besides these nervous system problems, but there are not many things that are good for Alzheimer's dementia or Parkinson's disease. So this is an important innovation. Going back up, the skin arm was developed in, in Russia and it generates signals transmitted through the skin and measures the response. And I've got of quite a bit of experience using this also because as an acupuncturist, if I come into a situation where a patient really seems stuck in a pathological pattern, I'll use the scan art to help change the pattern and the breakthrough, which is a boon for chronic pain or for chronic anything. Now this is found in the scientific peer-reviewed literature of magnetic pulses used to ease depression mainly on the prefrontal lobes of the, uh, the cerebrum. 
and then frequency-specific microcurrent. The frequencies were developed in the early 1900s during the golden age of healing science, and they were used with old electronic equipment that fell out of use in the 1940s. But in the 1990s, a chiropractor, Dr. Carolyn McMakin, began experimenting with this and using frequencies that were passed on from an osteopath who had one of these old machines. And the thing that's interesting to me about it is that they use microcurrent therapy and you can expect that to help with chronic pain, but it also helps with things like asthma, Crohn's disease, um, scar tissue, things that you normally wouldn't associate with, with uh, microcurrent therapy. Here's another doctor who cured cancer, Dr. Bjorn Nordenstrom. This is his book, Biologically Closed Electric Circuits. We've seen that in the 1890s, they were getting rid of tumors with uh, electrotherapy and also with electromagnetic waves. So this was rediscovered and it's hard to find. They have it at Clinic St. George, Austrian doctor Rudolf Peckar was using it. And there are a number of doctors in China who have been using it since the 1990s. The technique is fairly simple. A needle is inserted into the center of the tumor with a positive charge, and the negative charge needles are inserted around it no more than a centimeter and a half away from the tumor. Now I want to come back to nutritional science. Brain neurotransmitter restoration and stabilization in an integrated program reduced the criminal recidivism rate of drug offenders. Many drug care facilities, even the really prestigious and famous ones, have a very low success rate because the intervention is mostly psychotherapeutic, which has its value. But when you begin actually changing the neurotransmitter balance of the brain, then you start getting much better results. Here's an example. Sacramento Drug Court was started by a licensed acupuncturist who had had her own drug problems. And she combined the use of nutrition, acupuncture, counseling, and various patient empowerment techniques in a government-sponsored setting. They would get together and cook a meal together. They, they would have ear acupuncture, and they would show up for their drug court uh, Monday through Friday. This was for the nonviolent offenders. You had a choice. You could go to jail or you could do Sacramento Drug Court. So th this integrated program used the brain repair format, which depending on which drug a person was addicted to, they would be given an, an amino acid specifically to help restore what had been lost. Because drugs don't have any intrinsic power, they use our resources. Drugs use our brain neurotransmitters, our cytokines, our hormones, our minerals, our vitamins. And whatever gets used up needs to get put back. And if you put it back, then you can recover a lot faster. And so the recidivism rate was 17% in this program compared to 67% in non-participants. Another thing that came about after World War II is we, the return of botanical medicine. Ayurveda from India and the biogeny from France, Kampo from Japan and TCM from China, and new delivery systems, homeopathic dilutions, microspheres, uh, D3 technology is, was developed in France for treating unresponsive infections and AIDS, and then essential oil treatments for infections and of course, essential oils are used for a lot more. And the growth of aromatherapy has uh, um, been, I think, uh, an important uh, factor in healing. Here's a type of aromatherapy called Bolaire Jacquier, found in France. A volatile essential oil, the terpenes of this essential oil have been found in the study. Um, I helped them try to sub submit this to uh, Nature magazine, and it, it wasn't accepted. But their research showed that there was a higher efficiency of uptake of oxygen by hemoglobin when it was mixed with the essential oil. So the essential oil plus oxygen is better than oxygen alone for efficiency at the cellular level. And they found that it could reverse aging by breaking down glycation end products, which are 
and responsible for cross-linking and other uh, aging factors. So I don't know how much time I have left, but I want to talk a little bit about healing science in the future. Systems biology-based healing science. In other words, holistic. Stem cell technology. Electromagnetic, electronic, and light therapies like the ones that I just saw. Biological dentistry is making a little bit of a comeback, but it's still hard to find a good biological dentist in this country. Cancer treatment with hyperthermia, ozone, intravenous botanicals, intravenous proteolytic enzymes, along with biological dentistry could be a real cure for a lot of cases. Enzyme therapy in general, Wovenzyme was tested for shingles in the 1960s and the 1990s and found to be very effective because the proteolytic enzymes had antiviral properties. And in fact, at the beginning of, of the COVID epidemic, doctors in China were using proteolytic enzymes for treatment, as well as intravenous vitamin C, which was you know, referred to as the Shanghai cure. Then there, there is a scalar wave treatment that I also mentioned. And a few things that I haven't mentioned, Brown's gas activated water, psilocybin and entheogenic treatment for psychiatric disorders, near-death experience research. Dr. Saputo made a point very well taken about how spirituality has been uh, deleted from the scientific world. And I know that near-death experiences are, are very uh, controversial, but they should be researched just like everything else. And also breathing technologies. Uteco, holotropic breathwork, Tumo, and, and others have powerful therapeutic properties in a very short period of time. And then more treatment for emotional and psychological trauma. Treatment is needed for emotional and psychological trauma. Trauma is either the cause or the trigger for many cases of addiction, mental illness, crime, as well as chronic disease, because traumatized people have reduced natural killer cell activity, which makes them vulnerable to infection and which prevents the killer cells from destroying the cancer cells that our bodies produce every day. So there are lots of ways to treat them. I just listed a few here, acupuncture, emotional freedom technique. That's the, that's the, the, the tapping method where you make declarations and eye movement therapy, physical therapy modalities. So we want to know what you are interested in at Ormet Educational Institute. I've got one more story I'd like to tell because we, I spoke about near-death experiences, but there is one experiment that was done inadvertently, which could be a model for doing actual scientific research on near-death experiences. Near-death experiences were induced in experiments studying the effects of high G forces on fighter pilots. The pilots were placed in huge centrifuges and spun at tremendous speeds. First, they lost consciousness, and then they went into seizures. Then they lost all muscle tone. And when the blood stopped flowing into their brains, only then would they suddenly have a return to conscious awareness, which also involved a sense of separation from the body. The pilots would remark that death is very pleasant. So thank you for your attention. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share this. I hope that it's, that it's interesting for people. I hope there will be questions and feedback. And I hope that um, this will uh, stimulate some interest in uh, documentary and educational videos that, that uh, we want to um, produce. And I hope I'm right that if we can change the marketplace, we can transform medicine and, and healing. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. I can tell you that. Uh, it's very important. Uh, you know, I was really intrigued. Is it possible to go back to slide 41, the, th the third last slide? Let me see if I can find them again. I'm, I'm not very good at that. Uh, uh, well, we can do this. We can do this maybe okay. some other. Oh, there it is. Could you go? Yeah, go back to. Okay, so. Uh, Which one? Keep going. There it is. Oh yeah, okay. You gotta go back one now. Oh. There's a woman sitting in the it. chair. One more. Oh. 
There she is. Hopefully, if we record this, I want to discuss this with you privately. I want to discuss this with you privately. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And uh, um, I'm not so my French isn't very good. So help me. I'm going to, I wrote it down. I'm calling it slide 41. Am I right to say slide 41? Can you see? I have slide 46 out of 49. There you go, 46. Thank you, Scott. Okay, I couldn't see it, guys. Forgive me. In spite of even wearing glasses, I got pretty good eyes. Okay, Dan, thank you. Um, uh, any questions? Now would be the time with regards to uh, um, Dan's uh, presentation at this point. We're not getting, um, uh, how can I say, uh, we don't have a large, we have a different setup here than yesterday because we had difficulty getting Scott and Dr. Benz in. Uh -huh. So we've got a, uh, the only person that oh. can ask questions from the audience. Send me an email too if you have any questions that you can't think of right now. Yeah, right. Well, I'm, I'm going to be getting back in touch with you. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, Glad to have it, you back. We lost you for a while. Oh my God. And you lose me right at the www. T H E N H F. You know, so as uh, Dr. Saputo left, I'll, I'll get him on the phone. Uh, did he ultimately go, I'm joining? Did he make that commitment? Greg, come on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, think, I, I think it's safe to say we, we got him, okay? <laughs> okay, well, uh, th there's not many people I'm going to be talking to in the future that isn't going to be bullied, if that's what it takes, <laughs> into. Uh, <laughs> becoming members of the most important agency on earth right now. Okay. Uh, Beatrice, you have been so patient, you angel. And uh, uh, um, let me give a little bit of a background here to our audience. The National Health Federation of Canada Executive Director. So Beatrice is totally dedicated to the uh, past, the present, and the future of the National Health Federation and its global impacts. Um, psychologist, psychotherapist, holistic cancer counselor, uh, and she works out of the Netherlands and Canada. Um, she's got quite a story, I can tell you. Uh, her presentation topic is do not fear cancer. Everybody in the audience, hear what I'm saying to you about this particular topic. Do not fear cancer. Medicine bullies us into these radical uh, applications of, of you name it, like does chemotherapy work? What percentage of the time? Because everybody I know that has cancer dies of cancer. But the irony of it is, and what's evolved over the last 40 years, in my opinion, from my life experience, dealing with people very dear to us, uh, is that you, they get cancer, the cancer gets put in remission, the doctors are spectacular miracle makers, and then the cancer comes back. And then the cancer goes away again. And then, oh, the doctor's okay. And then it comes back. And then the patient dies. Okay. Um, uh, my brother, Jim Cration, he got the exact same cancer as his wife. Uh, cancer was cured, what, two or three times in her, 650,000 in, in you name it, insurance and what have you, diagnostics, and you got it, therapies. And my brother, Jimmy, got the same cancer, stage four in his neck, nothing but nutrition. Complete remission in six months. It's nine years later, continuing with a minimal amount of nutrition, and the cancers never come back. So when you think about nutrition and its values, I can only add one thing that I think Beatrice and probably Dr. Saputo would appreciate, is that we had people praying for Jimmy, and Jimmy was praying for himself. Okay, So it takes uh, two types of energy to cure cancer, in my opinion. And Beatrice is going to educate us. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I can tell you uh, prayer and nutrition works for so many people. I, in my life right now, uh, no words to tell you. So Beatrice, it's on you. Volume button, volume. Might be on the left side. 
Unmute her. She's muted. I don't know how to do that. She can do it. Self, but okay, there we go. Um, it's not only food and prayer that will help you. You really need to know what cancer is. And most people don't, they are only afraid. I want you to know that I'm Dutch. I work here in Canada at the moment and um, English is not my native tongue. So please be patient with me because I don't have sometimes the correct language. Daniel Levin showed me yesterday what real love is. I was deeply touched in my heart. He showed love that heals relations and unites people. We are love in the deepest of our essence. When we are able to access love in our hearts and do the work to open our heart chakra wide open. That is work. That is not something you just get by praying. Daniel Levin showed me he lives love with real human, humanness. However, we look evil in the eyes in many forms. Medical tyranny is all around us every day and in Canada, it's getting worse. I'm not convinced that psychopaths who have no souls and are not human, some of them, and also the humans who work with them, who have lost the connection with their hearts can be touched by love. We will have to use other devices to get them stop. We are in a different fight and um, maybe we even have to destroy, as Jesus says that when the time is there, evil will be destroyed. Each and every one of us individually must stand up, defeat the coward in ourselves, take a stand and take personal responsibility for our health and end the dependency inside ourselves to expect that there will be a savior, a method, a doctor, a healer from outside in any kind of form, shape, whatever, about whatever topic, illness, for the recognition of natural medical profession. The dependency is a child position. I'm a psychotherapist, so that is what I've done all my life until I healed from cancer in 2004. Then holistic cancer counseling came integrated in my psychotherapy. Dependency is a child position. We need to grow up and become responsible adults. This is a spiritual talk, uh, task of humans in this earth era. We need to grow up fast before we are eliminated. Big food provides people with processed toxic stuff that makes them malnourished and eventually sick. At that point, Big Pharma steps in and together with the by them controlled mainstream medicine, Big Pharma poisons the patient slowly with their multiple drugs, pretending to manage their illnesses and making them worse till death follows. Big efforts to make big profits from synthetic supplements, chemical drugs, and invasive harmful diagnostic procedures and destructive medical treatments. Big Pharma is a killing machine. If you don't believe me, I encourage you to read the recently published book entitled The Real Ant Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He portrays Fauci as a second Dr. Mengele with his cruel experiments of which he gives a lot of evidence. Big Pharma, under the leading authority and corrupt directions of Dr. Fauci, is only selling drugs to get Americans addicted to, pharmaceutical, to the pharmaceutical paradigm and keep them imprisoned in that toxic realm. 
The current vaccine mandates are the pharmaceutical coup against democracy, full-blown fascism. Aldous Huxley once stated, and that's already a long time ago, medical science has made such tremendous progress that there is hardly any healthy human left. Yesterday it was, and today it's also mentioned, how much iatrogenic deaths are in the medical system and that many patients take about 12 pharmaceutical drugs each day. I believe this is even underestimated when one also includes the COVID fraud and the deadly injections. I ask you to seriously think about the following. How has the human race survived all those millions of years before there was Western medicine, integrative medicine, big food and big pharma? You know the answer. It is our body's innate wisdom in relation to what Mother Earth and Father Son and Great Spirit provides us, which what we need to be thriving. We don't need dependency of all kinds of drugs and mechanisms and what kind of tools, because I have no doubt that the fact that chemical pharmaceutical medical medicines kill slowly, they slowly because be pharma intends to earn much money as possible before people wake up and understand the hidden game of the hidden aim of genocide. Already long term, I am convinced of this reality. And not only by my personal experience, healing naturally from metastasis cancer between 2001 and 2004, but also by reading critically other science, believing trustworthy anecdotic, anecdotical reports, excuse me for my language, of healed cancer patients. Dr. Christine Nolfi promoted natural healing from cancer already in 1948 in Denmark, first healing herself naturally from breast cancer and later coaching cancer patients similar to the way I do after she was thrown out of the Medical Association for, of Denmark and lost her medical license. It's nothing new. It happens all the time. Years and years. We must understand that the current medical tyranny is willfully imposed upon us and started long before 1900 with the objective to make the surviving people into slaves. It is us, each and every one of us, who need to get off our knees, onto our feet, explore, research, understand what is going on and understand what real natural healing is and stand up. We need to act as sane and rational independent adults who are able to discern, exercise the power of no, and pursue what is inspired by the breath of God, natural, biological, beneficial for us. We all must grow in personal responsibility for our health, lives, and actions and freedoms. It really works. I will give you an example of an intense experience from my own life, and after that, I will explain how I understand that natural healing comes about. 1984, I was a young woman of 36 year old expecting my first child. The delivery was very traumatic, took more than 48 hours and after medical failures and neglect left me physically a wreck. After my inquiries with the medical professionals, professionals involved, hearing the lies and seeing the cover-ups in my medical file, of which I demanded access, I took, after a deep painful process of realizing the betrayal, a conscious decision to not sue the midwife and the hospital, but to direct every effort towards steps that could help me get on my feet and heal. Coming from a family background, of conventional medical doctors and medical specialists, my father, my brothers, my uncles, I did not know better at that time than to follow the routes of mainstream medicine. And I can tell you it was an excruciating 
journey through the realm of mainstream medicine, and the end results were clearly devastating. I could not trust mainstream medicine any longer in 2001, 17 years after the birth of my daughter. This period also induced several years of, of included, this period also included several years of orthomolecular medicine with a really dedicated doctor who acted as a true detective to find the deficiencies, to supplement them with no avail and having belief systems of himself that were constricted. 2001, I was losing weight rapidly. I was so weak that I could hardly walk. My muscles were atrophying. I had many frightening and painful symptoms. I will not annoy you with that. I knew something was very wrong. It turned out after medical exams that I had tumors in my liver, my pancreas and my colon, several tumors. The eternal specialist and oncologist advised me the usual trio, chemo, radiation and surgery, a recipe for assisted suicide. There was an inner strong force in me that felt no. Of course, the usual fear mongering followed. Doctors stating that if I wouldn't follow their recommendations and protocol, I would have less than six months to live. To get a patient under control and earn big money from the mainstream treatments, doctors give a patient a threat of death and an expire date, mostly experienced by patients as a death sentence. I simply said, you're not God. I do not feel inside that I will die and stumbled out of the room. I never went back to mainstream medicine, doctors since 2001, not once. I knew inside when I was healed and healthy. Everyone knows. Some people told me with demeanor, oh, you were lucky. No, I made the right decisions that were in accordance to my soul journey and my soul contract. At the time in 2001, I had never heard of healing naturally from metastasis cancer. However, being strong enough inside to stand alone, to endure uncertainty and in meditation to go into my inner silence, new ideas would come up or attraction would be felt to certain natural methods like cleansing methods that I found in the books of the Canadian naturopathic doctor Hilda Clark, the liver cleans, and the necessity of treatments like panchakarma and specialized treatments of traditional Siddha medicine, Ayurveda, such as the virechanam and other specialized treatments. Those moments of silent knowing were like an inner pool. And I followed those sensations that came from deep inside of me. I knew I had to emotionally clean out deep traumas with fear of death and organized a three week stay in Los Angeles with the teacher of my regression therapy training and did three weeks every day, a session of three hours to reach the deep traumas of my childhood. And after that, I think I was healed already, but still I felt I had to do more. This step-by-step -step healing process turned out to be a necessary learning process through the labyrinth of healing to learn to stand strong on my own two feet, take personal responsibility for my soul journey, my life and the health of my physical body, the vehicle of my soul. As you can see, it worked for me. I'm still here, 2021, am healthy and have no symptoms. I followed my inner knowing and still do that. In hindsight, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me.
I woke up to the fact that when I follow my inner knowing, I know what to do, who to trust and where to go. I found out that cancer is not a deadly disease. Since 2004, after I was totally healed, vital, transformed in a different woman, I have not visited any GP, any other mainstream doctor, specialist for advice of treatments. I have not taken any toxic food or chemical pharmaceutical, deceitfully called medication. During my healing process, something has happened that opened and deepened my awareness profoundly for what was going on in the medical world. I had many questions about why I healed and other people with metastasis cancer die. I started exploring, reading, studying, doing more courses that were not mainstream about other psychotherapeutic treatments like regression and reincarnation therapy, past lives, what is our soul journey that cannot only get us in contact with deep suppressed trauma, but also bring us in contact with our soul contract and alternative medicine like traditional Ayurveda. I stepped out of the box. It wasn't easy, but I did it. I found out about so much different important issues, much different than the di current mainstream medical and the current psychological system wants us to believe. I began to see how doctors, oncologists, nurses, psychologists were controlled by big pharma, indoctrinated, bought and bribed, and that their data about patients were streamlined in diagnostic uh, categories in DSM-4 and DSM-5, and computer programs for filing the patient's data that do not leave any room for privacy and individual choice of treatment. Doctors and patients had to follow protocols. Also, there was a danger that these computer programs could be hacked by persons and organizations from the outside that would like to, more, to find more information about someone without asking permission. I did not want to be part of that system any longer stepped out and created my private clinic. And that's the adventure of life. Nothing is what it seems. The world is a perception deception. We have to look through the illusions that suit other interests and then we decided to follow on our soul journey in pursuing truth. The contemporary med medical education is under the dictatorship of pharmaceutical industry. It took several years before I understood that the phenomenon of suppression of naturopathy has a long history going back to before 1900. Before 1900, all doctors were using herbs, food, natural methods, such as en enemas to clean the body. I encourage you to explore the website www.100yearlie.com and find out what is said there about all the myths, myths that were going on, the fantasy Bruce, stories Bruce, that were told. Me myths. For interrupting. Can, you, can you read that site again slowly for everyone? www.100yearlie.com. And the most revealing part of this history is exposed by Edward Griffin in his book, World Without Cancer, the story of vitamin B17 on www.realityzone.com. Griffin describes the history of the cartels, such as the e early history of IG Farben, the chemical and pharmaceutical cartel and its marriage to DuPont, Standard Oil and Ford and how they worked together before World War I and more intensively after World War II. When you read Griffin's book, you will come to understand how chemotherapy was initially developed from the same chemical poisons, cyclone B and mustard gas, which IG Farben could no longer sell to the Hitler to kill the Jews and the armies of the allies after World War II was lost. 
the cartels schemed together what to do with all those poisons that they had in stock. Bayer was also engaged and in this plot and President Nixon was paid by the cartels to declare the war on cancer in order to raise the fear for cancer. So the profits of the so-called chemotherapy would raise sky high. The pharmaceutical industry or big pharma has become a multi-billion, maybe even multi-trillion industry and is not aiming to heal any patients. A patient is just a renewable source of income until this death. There is no long-term profit to be made from a cured patient. Similar as what with the current COVID-19 fraud, the tactic of scaring people to death about a non-existent new COVID-19 virus, because it's not new, raises big pharma's profits with vaccines to be able to acquire a vaccine passport and push the booster shots. <laughs> this is their pattern. They show it over and over again in history. In 1930, it was IBM that made the identification cards and gave every Jew a number. Which one would it be now? Rockefeller and his cronies. Before 1900, the Rockefeller group had bought the medical schools of universities in many countries by giving so-called donations and requiring in return a written signed contract that they will not educate in natural medicine. That is not just making it impossible. They imposed their pharmaceutical toxic products on with bribing doctors, bribing professors, bribing politicians, bribing lawma lawmakers up until now. Dr. David Martin can tell you all the details of the numbers of the patents and the laws that were made to make this possible. Conventional medical care treats symptoms of disease. The current mainstream medical system is chemistry based. However, whole, all living things have living chemistry, biological chemistry. Chemical and synthetic drugs, as Jörg said already, contain no life and are therefore incapable of creating life. In fact, they are often harmful. The truth is all chemical drugs are toxins. These toxins are stored in fat cells of the body and cause chronic diseases. There is not one not one scientific research report that has researched the dangers of the accumulated chemical medications in the body and how they interact with each other. None. Rockefeller destroyed the medical schools all over the world. And after he had ordered his friend, Mrs. Mr. Fletcher, to make a plan to set up the structure for the medical schools, the Fletcher report, and founded the World Health Organization, he got a control over worldwide sickness and death strategies under deceiving terms called health policies. <laughs> Creating problems like a planned pandemic and giving one solution, vaccines, that can be marketed with enormous profits, he and his followers committed treason to transparent and honest science. Medical science divorced from science long ago. It became scientism, a belief, a doctrine. Now I will tell you that cancer is not a deadly disease, it is a survival mechanism. <laughs> and I will show you how it is, how that is so. An important discovery of my healing journey was for me that cancer is not a deadly disease, but a survival mechanism. When one knows how a cancer tumor is developed in the body, 
and what the function is, one can reverse this process all by oneself at home. And the symptom of a tumor will disappear. It's of the utmost importance now because I expect that the medical system will totally fall apart soon. And you know why. That people understand, and it's important that people understand what health and natural healing is and how to achieve that on their own. They need to be educated in this field of natural healing. And I believe the National Health Federation has a task in providing that education. Only the removal of the causes of disease on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, will bring about true and lasting healing, true and lasting vibrant health. I will shortly explain how a cancer tumor grows in the body and what the function of a cancer tumor is. If you want to get a more detailed understanding, read my article, How to Reverse Cancer All by Yourself, that will soon be placed on the website of the NHF and NHF Canada. Every one of us in the audience has cancer cells in the body every day. When the metabolism of cells is healthy, the primary purpose of autophagy, a part of the healthy immune system, is to pick up any bacteria, subcellular or organelles, damaged cells, died off cells, damaged proteins, and other waste products to get rid of them, including cancer cells. There exist theories stating that the onset of, physical process, of a physical process leading to the development of a cancer tumor, and in my opinion, of any other disease, can be the unbalancing effect of an unexpected emotional shock, also called trauma. Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, Dr. Hammer, Dr. Friday, Dr. Morris, Dr. Neverton, Dr. Nolfi, and many others. Such a trauma can first cause disbalance in the energetic bodies, and at a certain point can cause brain damage that is visible on brain cells, on brain scans, and as a consequence can create other long-term post-traumatic stress reactions, psychological pattern behavior, and emotional dysfunction, fight, flight, freeze reactions with suppressed fear of death and suppressed vital energy life force. When such a long-term chronic process has had its negative tangible effects on body functions, it is called psychosomatics. It is well known in the medical world that a long-term stress response can eventually lead to a shutdown of essential functions of organs of the body. We have all the choice of not remaining limited to any traumatic life event and not staying caught in a victim, martyr, or cutting off attitude. We can choose to move beyond the shock of traumas and become the steward of the vessel of our life, our physical body. When one chooses to go to the bottom of painful traumas, and many people don't do that, they are afraid of the pain and the anger, when one chooses to go to move to the bottom of painful traumas, resolve them and chooses to feel the suppressed emotions, ultimately one's fear of death and that process goes deep and opens the heart. The trauma response has mostly cut off the feelings of by hormonal reactions stuck in the fight, flight, freeze trauma response and suppressed the emotions in the subconscious. After processing, feeling them and going through them, whatever it takes and letting go of the suppressed emotions of fear of death, anger and deep pain, catharsis, 
The revival of one's life force will open up like a, like a fountain. At that point, one can resume the course of life in a more free, joyful and wholesome way, making a shift in awareness and changing direction to fulfill one's purpose of life, one's soul contract. At that point, one can make new choices, make how to live one's life in healthy and meaningful ways. Long lasting, overt and covered, suppressed fear causes depletion of the adrenal glands due to the chronic production of stress hormones that in time shut down body functions. Under stress, especially functions of the body to eliminate toxins shut down and this, this results in additional buildup of toxins in the body. Medical, this is chemical, this is toxic suppression of emotional symptoms through the standard chemical antidepressants, antipsychotics, sleep medication, antibiotics, and other non-prescription over-the-counter medication will create more chronic diseases because chemical pharmaceutical drugs are not natural, not biological, and therefore are not recognized by the body. Unlike food and natural remedies, and these chemical compounds cannot be digested by the body and can only be stored as toxins in the cells, which causes the cells to become dysfunctional. And all this results in damaging the brain and other vital organs and body function as scientific research shows. Andreas Moritz, along with my Ayurvedic Vajja, offered me most fundamental and holistic perspective on what cancer is in the books entitled, Cancer is not a disease, it's a survival mechanism and timeless secrets of health and rejuvenation, big breakthrough medicine for the 21st century. Morris states, cancer and other debilitating illnesses are not actual diseases, but desperate, and final attempts by the body to stay alive for as long as circumstances permit. Cancer will only occur after all other defense or healing mechanism in the, bodies, in the body have failed. Cancer is on our side, not against us. Hippocrates stated on the front of his clinic on the front door of his clinic, that a patient who doesn't want to understand the cause of his illness should not pass over the threshold of his clinic. I like that attitude. He did not want to spend precious lifetime on a patient who doesn't want to take personal responsibility. Moritz turns every common belief system that is containing victim thinking upside down, stating, Cancer does not cause a patient, a person to be sick. It's the sickness of a person that causes cancer. That's why as a psychotherapist, I can deal with that underlying thing that is not physical. It's emotional and spiritual. Garner in agreement with Moritz states in his book entitled Conscious Health, the complete owner's natural health and healing manual, that it is lifestyle, not genetics, which primarily de determines our health. Cancer, he says, like Moritz, is the results of the body storing toxins in his effort to survive longer. As health problems arise, if drugs are taken to eliminate symptoms, their toxicity adds to the problem. The natural clean, uh, cleansing process of the body is suppressed and it's forced to degenerate toward more chronic disease. As toxicity increases in the storage areas, vitality decreases, parasites increase 
and degeneration and eventually muti mutation of cells occur, occur. Cells become altered and are no longer able to reproduce themselves in their originally healthy form. They reproduce diseased cells, which lead to chronic disease. If this toxic process continues, the body dies. Cancer cells, for, exam for example, are the result of this process. Cells that are healthy have not changed structure and function. They have, but cancer cells have mutated. Whereas healthy cells utilize oxygen, cancer cells use carbon dioxide. This function, similar to plant cells, increase in size and storing the, in the body's toxins own toxic wastes. If the body did not store the toxins encased in a tumor, for example, the toxins would be free to range throughout the body and the bloodstream and thereby causing the damage or death of vital tissues and organ, organs much sooner. Again, cancer is the result of the body storing toxins in its effort to survive longer and not a death sentence as is commonly believed. Cancer has a multitude of contributing factors. It is also the result of excess toxicity, which affects and eventually destroys cells or transform them into abnormal wild growing cells. Cancer above else is a cellular oxygen deficiency disease as Dr. Otto Warburg, a Nobel Prize winning biochem biochemist in 1930s concluded that the prime cause of cancer is imp impaired cell respiration. Tumors are not body mistakes. They are examples of body wisdom. Body wisdom at work, making a desperate stand to protect us from the effects of poisons we have allowed in our bodies. A real cure of cancer does not occur under the standard mainstream medical model at the expense of destroying a tumor and other vital organs of the body like lymph nodes. Such destruction literally leads to imperable damage of entire organs and systems in the body. I agree with Morit and Garner that the current invasive medical treatments seem to add to and intensify long-term problems and deprive patients from the vitality and life force necessary to heal. The real healing first comes from one's own growing in awareness, our soul function, how one is harming the body, and what the root cause in history of that harming of body is. What is the trauma? And then after deep emotional insight and letting go of suppressed emotions, changing his behavior, his or her behavior to taking better care of the body and learning more in order to improve their care of the body, that's the way to go. Deep rooted, Constant inner conflicts, guilt, shame, and traumas from abandonment with fear of death can easily paralyze the body's most basic functions. Poor self-image, unresolved conflicts with loved ones, constant worries, and or past emotional trauma deeply buried in the unconscious, even of a past life, were present in myself and were present in every ca cancer patient that I've coached, who I've coached, whether they were initially aware of it or not. Cancer patients will always show a strong undercurrent of uneasiness, a deep-seated frustration with their current life and cover up their unfinished business with strong victim and even martyr mechanisms thinking that the body fails them. They also tend to have workaholic patterns 
and abusing her, their body, hidden and over denial of serious problems in their intimate relationships, and the tendency to accuse others for their own lack of being, of well being and problems. Long term stress causes toxins. So, thorough detoxification is the first necessity. The real cure is only achievable when the root causes of excessive growth of cancer cells have been removed and stopped. Whatever happens in our emotional body, and that is mostly not only in our physical body, but also in our energetic bodies, occurs in our physical body. The real cancer is trapped in an isolated emotion, a feeling of having no choice through the mind-body connection, any repressed feeling of wanting and deserving harmony, peace, stability, and simple sense of joy in life are translated into appropriate biochemical responses in the body. This feeling of having no choice effectively deprives the body of all these positive qualities as well. Cells are not physical mechanisms which have no feelings, no sense of eyeness, or no reaction to ex external threats. All cells have a feeling of consciousness, of eyeness. Our soul is in every cell of our body. Stress is felt in the cells, and the cells cannot determine where the stress comes from. It's there, it's the contraction of the body and toxic minds are translated in a toxic body. Candace Peart, neuroscientist, has found convincing evidence on cellular level for this process in her scientific research about biochemistry of emotion in her book, Molecules of Emotions, Why We Feel the Way We Feel. Emotional suffocation seen when one keeps thoughts and emotions to oneself out of fear of being criticized and hurt turns into poisons of the body. So we poison ourselves too. Victim tears, poor me tears, contain poison. These poisons are so strong that if one cried and put our tears into a snake on a snake skin, they would burn her holes into it. Tears of real deep sadness after the loss of a loved one contain healing substances. That's the process that is needed for the body. And tears of joy do not contain poisons. They have strong healing properties and makes the cells of the body feel loved. When such nectar is experienced, the energy of the body gets greatly boosted. Also experiencing real, deeply, heart-connected sexual lovemaking, we can reach ecstasy. This deep felt energetic connection with the beloved partner and the merging of two deeper energy bodies give couples wings. The cells of the body thrive on this deep love energy that is shared between one another. I can tell you that sexual experiences are always topic to explore. In contrast, constant emotional strain and struggle lead to many symptoms. One of them is stone formation in the bile ducts of the liver and the gallbladder. Consequently, the digestive fire slows down because of curved secretion in the bile, of the bile. When the body cannot proper, properly digest, there will be accumulation of large quantities of waste in the small and large intestines and liver stones in the liver. Chronic constipation and the poor absorption, absorption of nutrients, fats, calcium, zinc, magnesium, and vitamins will become increasingly depleted and the bone tissue, bone marrow, and reproductive functions will become weakened. It's well known that when the liver is weak, cancer tumors come to its rescue to help when, with the de 
detoxification. Even Dr. Gerson had discovered that. Garner says, whenever there is stagnant food matter, there's fermentation and rotting. That's what foul bathroom odor and bad breath coming from the buildup in the stomach is all about. And where there is rotting, more toxins are formed. When fecal matter sits in the colon for longer than normal, toxins are absorbed back into the body and cause auto intoxication or self poisoning. An example is that diverticula pockets, I hope I say it right, sac like hernias in the colon, which may have been there for many years, can lead to colon cancer. My Ayurvedic Vajja explained me that even the villi in the, small intest in the small intestines during many years of stress, the villi are all those little things, during many years of it, become totally filled up with dirt and the nutrients or supplements that we cannot, cannot, cannot even enter our blood vessels. So when our villi are totally filled up in the, in the small intestines, you cannot take up supplements. That's why several years of automolecular um, medicine didn't help me. I had too much dirt in my body. It had to go out. When that happens, the small intestines and the colon are not able to absorb even the nutrients from food and costly supplements that one pours into the body. This process can become very dangerous for anyone and may result in intestinal toxemia. The digestion of meat, dead food coming from a cadaver, causes the most dangerous toxin, cadaverine. Long-term buildup in the intestines causes chronic constipation and putrefied residues to stick to the wall of the colon, colon, causing poor absorption of nutrients. The thorough cleaning of the liver, stomach, kidneys, and intestines must be done by anyone who wants to heal naturally. The 3E protocol designed by Lothar Hirnaise, the author of the book, Chemotherapy Heals Cancer and the World is Flat, that I apply with my cancer patients can all be done at home by the patient themselves. I'm only there to listen to them, to help them reveal their emotional conflicts and work them help them work them through and coach them toward the next step they want to take in the healing process. Intensive work and successful. That can include the, the, uh, the use of another natural medical professional, but it doesn't have to. It can, if they have the money and they want to do that, why not? If they don't have the money, they can heal with very cheap ways. It must be noted that when one decides to start cleansing, cleansing the liver, kidneys, stomach and intestines, one needs to go on till all are empty of poisonous materials and start reproducing clean and healthy cells. It takes persistence and resilience to heal and become rejuvenated. Toxins that have been built up in the body for many years do not disappear after one cleanse. They, there is no quick fix. There is no free ticket to freedom and health. On a cellular level, when the reproductive tissue, which maintains the genetic blueprint of the cells is starved of oxygen, and nutrients, the, it's only a matter of time before normal and healthy cells begin to mutate their genes and abnormally divide in order to survive the famine. Normally, a host of immune cells, pancreatic enzymes, digestive enzymes, and vitamins break down cancer cells in the body wherever they appear. However, most of the digestive enzymes are already used up quickly when the diet is full of energy is rich of animal protein, such as meat, pork, poultry, fish, eggs, cheese, and milk, as well as sugar and rich food. The microbiome in our guts becomes severely toxic. Cancer cells are cells 
fighting to survive in a hostile, toxic environment, letting go of the need to fight, so relaxation and rest, on a deep emotional level, reprograms the DNA of the body, changing its course of warfare and eventual annihilation to one of healthy reproduction. Not needing to fight for their survival gives the cancer cells a chance to be accepted again by the entire family of cells in the body. Relaxation, rest, meditation are helping to achieve this, this state. Mega doses of enzymes can help with the cleaning. There's of course much more. My 3E program is quite elaborate, a daytime work for the, for the people. Cancer cells are normal cells, even coffee enemas. They can bring back the glutathione in the liver. They can stimulate the production of glutathione. Yes, of course, you can take it with a pill. It's easier. But to really know that the body will do it by themselves, that gives inner, how would you say that, confidence. Cancer cells are normal cells that are rejected by what they consider home. They are deprived of proper nourishment and support. In their desperation to survive, they grab everything that they can find to live on, even cellular waste products and toxins. This practi practically turns them into outcasts, says Moritz. It's known that tumors attract and contain lots of toxins and that by fermentation, they provide the body a little bit of energy. This is shown in the experiments of Dr. Cosmini, Cosmine, a French doctor in the theory of the second liver. Symptoms of the body are only warnings and we need to take personal responsibility to understand the messages that are conveyed to us about the cause of the symptoms, explore the options to heal and take action that helps us reverse the process. Instead of making it worse by adding more toxins like medications or consent to invasive methods that wound the body more. We need to find out how to reverse a debilitating process and help our brain to and gut to detoxify and become healthy again. Like every other disease, cancer is but a toxicity crisis. Cancer cannot be its own cause. And I have been searching long what the innate healing power of the body is. Natural, natural healthcare professionals tout the body has an amazing power to heal, but they never say that in physical terms. Well, I found it in the work of Dr. Jupp. Yep. He describes how our cells are ever morphing, vibrating, shimmering, harmonic, electromagnetic, living colloids, which have colloid life cycle. And they can change by themselves into bacteria, viruses, and into cancer cells. And they can reverse back to healthy cells and decide to die, apoptosis, or to become healthy and reproduce healthy cells. That is what healing is. And about um, um, epigenetics, George has, has talked, it's another aspect. I understand epigenetics as Bruce Lipton, it has shown in his book, Biology of Belief, as that our consciousness, our awareness, can turn on and turn off genes, express them or not express them. And that is an aware process. So every human being can consciously change their course of life. There is one other thing that has not been, not been said today and yesterday. Ayurveda is so powerful that it by physically cleaning the body until all the chakras are clean can help the person 
that the strong Kundalini energy comes up from the bottom of the spine up until the top of our head and is connected through all the chakras. And that can only be when the chakras are clean. They can, it cannot stream when they are not, not clean. They will give good. And that Kundalini process is a very normal process in India is hardly known here. And of course, people speak of Kundalini yoga, but it's not the same thing as I have notified, uh, uh, as I have experienced in my Ayurvedic treatment of um, the awakening of the Kundalini and the feeling, the physical feeling, what that is. And that makes people immensely strong because it connects the individual personal soul through the crown chakra with the divine soul. And when that channel is totally clear that way and that way, we are really spiritual beings. And I must say one other thing, beware of your language. When you, when you say, oh, you've beaten cancer, or so we can fight cancer with food, that is language based on fear terminology, fight flight terminology. And that is not, you induce fear in people as if they have to fear cancer when it is a survival mechanism. Nobody has to fear it. People have to clean. And there is one disclaimer that I have to make. All that I have said above is valid and this is, I, I, I feel it's really sad to say this, for undamaged people, undamaged by the current mRNA vaccines. It is sad to say that the decision to allow the mRNA concoction to be injected in one's body, then one allows the start of diminishing the natural immunity by the self the self replicating process of the spike protein that has entered in the nucleus of a cell and that suppresses dna dna repair and causes explosions of cancer tumors because the immunity has has been suppressed and um, that's a disclaimer i'm not talking about the explosion of cancer tumors after being inoculated by mRNA vaccines. I'm talking about the old fashioned cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you very much. What a perspective on uh, the values of detox uh, and spirituality that arrives from it. I think I've been hearing about it since I was really a young guy, like 16, 17, 18, Albert Huxley and these guys, and uh, Ram Dass later, uh, what have you, uh, really precious uh, insights. I'm glad that we have those insights right now and captured them. Have you ever shared that information in a way that it was captured before? I wonder. Yes, I did in Holland, in Dutch, in several magazines. But yeah. uh, taking responsibility for one's own healing process is something that is very aversive to most people that have not grown up to be an adult and take responsibility for their life. They, they, they want to be kept on the hand and lead it by a doctor and what yeah. the doctor says is true and they will follow that. I cannot help those people. <laughs> they, they have to grow up first. <clears throat> you know, Socrates, I can't, I can only paraphrase, but he said, the man that reaches, I believe he said, the man that reaches the age of 40 who is not his own doctor and doctor to his family has not grown up, has not matured. I agree with that. Can't argue with Socrates. Can't argue with Beatrice Penn either. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Uh, but it's but it's very hard because many people um, like that dependency. 
want that dependency, you want as a child that there is a good mother or father who will take care of them. Well, we have to take care of ourselves. As you said, adolescence, you know, has its moment in our lives and then we have to outgrow it, you know. But the problem is where to get the education to know what to do. And there's the bane of our existence. Really valuable. I can't wait for the, uh, the conversation you shared with us today to end up at NHF. Uh, what's the time well, on that? Well, the art, my articles uh, that I have written uh, to make people uh, aware of the destructive and, yeah, I think not favorable route to take uh, are on the NHF Canada website, but this will be added, I think, will, within a month. Okay, and it would it be on the NHF global site? No? I think Scott will do that. Yeah, well, I look forward to staying in touch with you because we need it on our site. Hi, Scott. Hi. Uh, yeah, it would be it would be on both sites. Yeah, so, I thought so. Just like you thought, Beatrice. Yeah, I thought so because it's very important information. We know that with the many diseases that the mRNA vaccines are going to cause, the whole medical healthcare system will be overwhelmed. And when I hope lots of nurses and doctors will walk out and keep themselves clean and healthy, um, still the medical, the medical, um, uh, the medical system will collapse. I expect the medical system will collapse. And if people have knowledge about there are other ways and it can also be the help of another natural healer it, that's okay if there are other ways that's important uh, does scott, that answer uh, your question jack because you were speaking with somebody else i, ju I just got it interrupted uh and I wish you would repeat the get halfway back. Just because yeah. it's it's um I want it to be on both websites. Right. And Scott has agreed to that now openly. Yeah. So and, and on our uh, side. Our side. Because, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I can send it to you. Yeah, well, you know, my whole world you. is about getting information yeah. to people that can serve yeah. as you I know, can it's send all it to education, you education, education, education. Yeah. Jin Yang. Jin Ying, my dear brother, my Chinese brother, you do me a favor. You become a member of NHF. <laughs> and we have too much to share with the globe of humanity. We've got to get you on the board of advisors of the Future of Medicine Foundation as well. But what I said it was, and you're not listening again. Sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I'm, this has been a long No, time. you're not sorry at all. Yeah, you just do it all the time. It's been a long time, <laughs> a long day. Uh, Jack's had a lot to do to pull this Five together. Days. Five days. So forgive me, your insensitivity is okay with me, Beatrice. Don't worry, I can handle it. Uh, but please, but please, I'm sorry. I'm a very sensitive person, Jack. But <laughs> God bless I'm you. I'm insensitive to certain certain yeah. Uh, yeah. behavior. I couldn't control the person who came in and they demanded that attention because of their question was serious to what they were dealing with. I couldn't. So do you want to hear point. what I had to yeah, say? Yeah, or don't yeah, yeah. So we, yes. It's okay if you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> I really, I'm really dying to hear it. If I don't I hear it, I'll... our whole medical system will collapse. Not only by the um, um, overwhelming effect of people <coughs> who will get severely ill from mRNA vaccines also by the walkout of uh, medical professionals. And if people don't know what to do and think that cancer is a lethal thing, they can even better not treat it and just let it be like your father, uh, Gregory. He has, he has had eight years of cancer. Yes, of course, because it's not deadly. It does something for the body. So then they better just actually, walk actually, with the cancer you know, with my dad, he was diagnosed in 1975. My dad went metastatic in 1994 and was still walking on the golf course and carrying his clubs in 2018. 
he had he had a, a about a about a 45 year run with it it's amazing my dad's psa when it peaked he was over 11000 my dad routinely carried around a psa over 2 or 3000 regularly yeah never had his prostate removed never did any chemotherapy uh and and it's interesting because as fast as the metastases would form, they would turn to rock. And it also. was, uh, yeah, he was very surprised. That, in fact, when he had a back surgery, they couldn't believe how, how strong his bones were for somebody who had uh, a PAP that was elevated significantly along with his PSA. And he was, uh, once he realized that his PAP was uh, going up by 1994, he figured, there was no point in doing anything. The cat was already out of the bag in terms of any, he would never do any invasive uh, therapies anyway. No. But you're right. He I think it's right. very important people, people lose sight track of that. You can live with cancer. And yeah. most people, in fact, what most people don't realize is that they don't find out, of course, until uh, post-mortem. Uh, it's it's very right. common that people have people have cancers yeah. in them. I just wanted to say in my uh, yeah. in my community in my community in Holland there was found a, a, a very old lady uh, dead under suspicious circumstances and it turned out she had cancer all over her body and she mm -hmm. had lived eighty eight years no no complaints she felt healthy yeah and that's another whole another discussion in terms of you know when you. You know, when you go and do a biopsy or do any of these procedures, uh, in large measure, you're not doing that for you. You're doing that for the doctor. It, it's for the it's doctor's a, liability a, yeah. that's being done. And you have to make a decision. Well, if, if you were to find out that you have such and such, you have to have a decision beforehand as to what are you prepared to do? And it, that's something which people, they, they get into a, a very vulnerable position and feel very... Uh, out of control and so they they want to turn it over to someone else but yes. uh, hope but is very if you, powerful if you if you read my uh, my articles on the canada, canada health uh, website one also will give you the report of 2013 how a biopsy can cause metastasis cancer and it's iatrogenic sure. right. and like yeah. every operation can cause new and the radiation can cause new thing. It's not the cancer is back. No, the doctors caused it. Yeah, and drugs, yeah. anesthesia, and opioids. Of course. Yeah. Just yeah. going to a dentist office, doing something as simple. People joke around about it with laughing gas. Uh, it is. It is very antagonistic to vitamin B twelve. And can devastate people. Yeah, yeah. The, the the dentist laughs with me when I say, "No, do what you have to do without anesthesia," and then they laugh at me. Can you stand that? I said, "Yes, I can stand that. I'm used to that. I don't want it." But you have to stand up for anything like that. Yeah, you don't want it, or you must know. I do it today. And I start my detoxification tomorrow. Whoa. But I don't want to, I want to do all the extra detoxification. I do enough every day and, and, and thinking slow. Well, you know, this is also ties in with what, what Jorge was talking about. I mean, these Hain studies that have been going on now decade after decade, it is tragic when you see how the, the level of malnutrition that, that is on the surface let alone the fact that there's so much subclinical malnutrition that all these doctors miss routinely. I don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we lose Jack again? No, no, no. You didn't lose me. You didn't no. lose me at all. You didn't lose me at all. Uh, I got. I just. Uh, okay. Life Thank is life is much. life is closing in on me here. <laughs> I've been alone, and it's been wonderful. Scott, please, uh, because of the nature of this video and its value, uh, I think that the last moment is, uh, should be uh, something where we hear from you in direct relationship to whatever your interests are at this moment, based on everything you've seen for two days and, 
and the work you've just done with Codex and um, and what you probably have to do the next the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, and you and we did have a beautiful conversation about your aspirations for the future. So uh, here you are and your, yeah. your most valuable mind. So I wish you'd share you. it share it with us. Well, it's very kind of you. I don't know what I can add to all the marvelous speakers you've lined up for us uh, for yesterday and today. So I really, I guess the first words out of my mouth should be, thank you, Jack, for having put this together. And you did have to do an enormous amount of work that a lot of it's behind the scenes. You just um, can't see a lot of the work that, and effort that went into this whole project and people may look at it and say, oh, it's just a day or two, but um, it's really, I know how much work it can be. And even then I can't appreciate all the work that you put into it. So that's sort of first priority is to thank you, Jack. And then the second priority is probably, uh, not probably, is certainly to thank all the participants, um, you know, individually and, and as a group, and it really just seemed to, to blend very well together. There are different viewpoints, but you know, that's what NHF is about. It wasn't called a federation because it was, uh, you know, a monolithic block. It was called a federation because it houses under its umbrella all different viewpoints, just as long as they're combined by sort of the commonality of people should be free to seek whatever treatments and way of treating that they wish or way of living that they wish, just so long as they aren't infringing upon the equal right of others to do that. So um, that's really what NHF has been about for 66 years, more than 66 years. We're almost going on 67 years. So um, I think you only have eight years on NHF, Jack. The uh, you're you're a little bit older than NHF, but I noticed something. They were bragging at the Codex meeting today about how Codex is approaching its 60th anniversary, and I wanted to say, well, let's see. NHF was six years old when you started, and so we're we've been around longer than Codex. Uh, tomorrow, I have to look forward to at the Codex meeting a big battle over Zilpaterol with, uh, you know, that's that Arnold Schwarzenegger drug they give to cattle and poultry oh, right. and others to sort of beef them up. And so we have that big battle tomorrow that we've won twice, twice before we've won that. The first time in 2018, where thanks to NHF almost alone uniquely, uh, we battled Monsanto and and, and others and the so-called uh, health for animals, which is nothing more than a front group for, for Merck. I'm sorry, I said Monsanto, I meant to say Merck, which makes Zilpaterol. And we battled them with all their millions of dollars they've sunk into the product in terms of getting uh, adopted by Codex. And the reason it's important for them is because Europe, a, uh, China, uh, the EU, I should say, including Switzerland and Norway, uh, China, India, if I'm not mistaken, and certainly Russia, they all ban anything that's a growth promoter for animals. They say it has to be therapeutic. You can't use it otherwise. And it's a very sensible uh, public policy that they have. But of course, in the Western hemispheric states from Canada, to Argentina and Chile in the South, and I include Venezuela and Cuba, uh, they all allow Zilpaterol. So they all support, I'm sorry, they all support having a Zilpaterol standard. Not all of them do allow it. It's funny, you see that with the Australian and New Zealand delegations, the Codex offices are arguing a particular point that their own internal government, domestic government does not support. And so they're extremely hypocritical in that respect and clearly owned by the pharmaceutical and drug, you know, other drug uh, uh, industries. So we have that battle tomorrow. I'm hoping we win it. They're going to try to push the football over the 
the, the goal into the goal zone. And so we have to stop it. Now, uh, earlier this year, I think it was mid-July, there was the Codex Committee on Residue of Vet Drugs and Foods meeting, and we were able to stop it again. But this time, to be honest, it was more due to the European Union than, and maybe the Russian Federation than anyone else, because they really spoke up well. See, at the meeting in 2018, they didn't argue the science. They just said it's against our public policy. So all the other people hooted and hollered and said, well, it's about science here. It can't be about public policy. So it should be adopted, you know, pushed up for adoption by the Codex Commit Commission itself. Uh, and we in HF were the only ones to speak out and say, look, it is about more than just public policy. This is a dangerous item. It, it harms the animals, many of the animals it's given to. The residues appear in the meat that people eat. Uh, it causes all sorts of cardiac and other problems in, in humans. And um, it's also leading to bacterial overgrowth in the big feedlots where it's used. So this is what we argued and we were able to stop it. Last time they picked up on our theme, the EU and Russia and others, and they argued more than just public policy. So we'll see. But anyway, I'm rambling on about something that's kind of esoteric. The, the main thing that really confronts us now, the danger, I mean, Codex is it in many, many ways, especially with their abysmal command of the scientific literature and nutrition and all of that, uh, but uh, is really the COVID thing and this big push to take over uh, control of everyone's life and lives. And we already seeing it rolled out in the, um, what would you call it, the, the tip of the spear states like Australia and New Zealand and Canada now. Notice these are Anglo-Saxon countries where they're doing this. And this is a, a big, huge problem. America, they're fortunately, Americans are digging in their hill, heels. The Italians are doing the same. I mean, the French have done it to fight it, but they'll keep at it until they wear us down or they hope that they wear us down. So. We'll see what's going to happen. Maybe uh, it, it'll be a replay of the 1848 revolutions in France that tumbled a whole bunch of dynasties. And uh, we'll see that happen in the world because uh, it's not about defense anymore. If we're going to win this, it's got to be about offense. It's offense, offense. And we've got Absolutely. to- take this power back from them. And we've got to play for keeps, we've got to win. Uh, we have a huge bureaucratic state aligned against us. And you notice they're all in lockstep, whether it's Health Canada in Canada, which is the you know Canadian FDA equivalent, or it's the MHRA in the UK, which is the FDA equivalent there or it's Ocaleps, which is the French equivalent of the FDA there, or the German agency, or you name it. They all seem to be in lockstep and they're all, you know, they've all learned this lesson, interestingly enough from Codex, about harmonizing, harmonizing the rules and regulations and the controls over people. And, uh, and that's what we have to fight. And we have to fight it through uh, united action. We have to fight it through probably civil disobedience. And we have to fight it through politically and legis and um, I'm sorry, uh, with litigation in the courts. But you know, the courts are almost too far gone. They, they're almost up all beyond the pale now. And um, so that's why it has to be kind of a multi-level action against uh, all of these entities. We can't depend on the alphabet agencies to protect any of our rights. It's very clear they're on the other side now. In fact, they are the other side. They are the other side. And um, so we're coming down to the wire. That's why the last uh, news release that we sent out that wasn't about the Zoom meeting or anything started out saying, this is it, folks. I mean, we're down to the wire and we have to defend ourselves um, 
kind of furiously now, but we have to do it intelligently. So this is part of the process, letting people know through what you've done here, Jack, letting and all the speakers have done, letting people know there is an alternative out there because you can't tear down the old system without having another system that exists for it. And the problem is a lot of the people out there don't know it exists. Right. Or if they do, they don't know that it really works. So that's our job to educate them and to do what needs to be done to bring them around to be with us. Now, someone probably smarter than I said, you don't win by arousing the sheep. You win by arousing the sleeping lions. And so we need to get all those other sleeping lions out there to join That's in. That's my job. That's this, my job. No matter what country they're in, you know? So anyway, thanks for that last word. I don't know if I have anything more to say other than- I have, oh, I have a question I, for you. Go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I almost forgot for like the fifth time. And we need to remember our sort of unsung heroes who are being mistreated right now. And one of them is David Noakes, the chairman of the National Health Federation. He's sitting rotting away in a French prison. And um, we just very saving lives for so I watched. Said, oh, day. yes. For thank you. He, yeah, for helping to save lives with the, the martyr, product the living called, martyr. The product, yeah, a product called GCMAF, GCMAF, as the English call it. And uh, as most other people call it now, having adopted that way of saying it. But GCMAF, I won't go too much into it, but it's something that every healthy human makes in their body. But people can go to the website, www.gcmaf.se for Sweden, SE. That's the only country where the pharmaceutical industry shills and trolls couldn't take down the website. They took them down from the UK and elsewhere, but they couldn't take down the Swedish one. So it's still there and you can read a lot about what's been happening. You can also quite naturally go to the nhf.com website. And there we have a lot of information on GCMAF and all of that. I mean, it's been around for ages and it has over 300, maybe even double that number of scientific papers that have been published on the subject showing how incredibly safe it is and how effective it is. You talk about chemotherapy, the effectiveness rate of it is either 2.3% if you go by the Australian study or 2.1%. But with GCMAP, if you follow the uh, dietary regimen protocols, the success rate is you know, 70 to 100%. They had 100% success rate with pancreatic cancer, 100% success rate with liver cancer. Now, admittedly, these weren't large you know, numbers of uh, people they treated, but the ones they did, they had a great success rate with. Anyway, he's there and we need donations for his legal defense. If anyone's watching this feels so inclined, we, uh, uh, you can go to our website and donate, just specify it's for David Noakes legal defense. His trial is, his appellate trial is coming up on December 6th, 7th, and 8th of this year, 2021. And he um, was already sentenced to four years for the crime of saving lives. There wasn't a single consumer complaint, no patient complained, only the pharmaceutical industry complained on trumped up charges. So uh, that's where we're at. And uh, I wanted to make that pitch and let people not forget about David Noakes. You're on mute. Um, and I don't forget about him. I pray, I pray for him. Uh, my, let's get the NHF deal done, Scott. Let's, let's get that signed. Yes. I got to get shot from a cannon, uh, end of story. <laughs> uh, Dr. Yeah. Jorge, uh, we're inviting you to the Board of Advisors of the Future of Medicine Foundation. We want you to become one of the early activists with us 
in direct relationship to helping to deliver NHF the fuel it needs to grow exponentially to deal with a problem so totally unique on earth, the COVID debacle, organized crime in the mainstream of government and medicine. Uh, uh, my Chinese brother here uh, absolutely understands this. Uh, he's immigrated to, uh, he's a lawyer that's immigrated to uh, the United States and uh, uh, runs a pretty good operation for help uh, getting people from a cross-cultural exchange perspective to talk. I'm inviting you, uh, Jin Yang, to uh, become a member of NHF and to become active uh, in helping us to heal a globe of really a globe of illness right now. And Jorge, what do you say? Can we get you to become a member of NHF? You got to click your button. You got to. Can't hear you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> It's been a long day. Yeah. You know, we, uh, really we would love really. to have you on board. Um, yeah. But not oh. to put you on the spot. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> but we will. <laughs> but we will. My job is to put people on the spot because each I and know. every one, you know, it's like one person at a time. But when we get done, we have spoken to a few thousand people here. We're going in the, we're going to go now into the Diana Hamilton show. I'm going to open that gateway. Okay. And, and then we're going to, we, the world leader summit, we are actually growing this baby with our Egypt. And it has quite a, it, I think there's some numbers that I've been, I've heard where 35,000 people have, have grabbed segments of, of uh, this last five days of the forum, uh, the, the, World Leadership Summit, um, uh, the summit, it's, I mean, the summit, okay. So our two-day event is going to blossom into an entire year of activity, okay? Greg, I'm hoping yeah. that, you, that you will join with me from the, the example I'm pulling off with uh, World Chocolate Inc. and allow me to get, uh, to help grow uh, Olaloa into markets beyond way beyond okay. our borders and and to we, work we with can people. we can discuss that Jack there's plenty of time to discuss that okay. I can't wait because we're succeeding with uh, as a matter of fact I'd like to share uh, uh, I, and I couldn't share it uh, uh, but here let me show you guys uh, how do you do it how do you oh there it is share screen let's see what happens here. You got to share the screen and then uh, it, it tells it to record. Okay. The joke of it is, is I can't find my, uh, my file. I, I thought I had it. As a matter of fact, do I have it? No, no, it's gone. My word. I, this computer just crashed earlier and now I've lost. Word. Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you know? So I can't show you, I can't bring it up, but uh, to assist on Egypt, and the and takeover of this company. And uh, I can tell you that we did a small amount of money to help sponsor this event. And he was really excited. He goes, because I know you, Jack, we've got a lot of research on you. He says, that little, little mustard seed of help is gonna blow up into a mustard tree. So yeah, we, and, it's, and Puerto Rico is gonna play a hell of a role in this because Mike, Mike has got the passion for it. Now I'm re meeting Jorge and, uh, these guys are all members of the board of it uh, on the on the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hall of okay. Fame Hall of Fame guys. And at, at, when you think about the complete complete failure, the ineffectiveness of ISOM to brand market anything. No, I I've talked to people all over. No one has ever heard of ISOM except people that are in ISOM that are integrative medicine, bracket, what have you. And, and it's like, you know, our first approach was let, let's get ISOM up and running and let's work with them. And uh, Dr. Chang and Dr. Levy, everybody supporting that. And uh, uh, I literally, I had the, we had the president of, of uh, Japan on uh, the board. Uh, 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 yeah, Yanisawa. Right. Yanisawa, he's a wonderful man. 
And at the end of the day, Carter, Steve Carter, basically killed it all. It's like the mediocrity. And then everybody dealing from a conspiracy perspective, which wipes out their entire ability to ultimately get into the op-ed realities of medias and all the other dynamic medias that, that are really mainstream media in minor senses that grow. I've been through all of this my whole life a number of times. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, close this event with, uh, I wanna close it with a prayer. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us all together. I thank you, the essence of God, the one God that brought us all together, and that without your intervention in our lives, we will not succeed. So intervene in our lives so that we may succeed in every way to return health to humanity in every way that's necessary. Thank you, guys. Greg, I don't know how to shut off the faucet on this, but you're well, the new host. You're I'm, the host. I'm looking for I'm looking for the uh, the system and how to do that because I was told by a regent that if we don't do this properly, we'll lose the recording. So, um, oh shit! <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> because uh, because it's, uh, it's a recording. Basically, if you turn off it, it will automatically record in the system, and also okay, so it stops. Yeah. You can set up to record it on our account, which is uh, with uh, zoom.us. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can set up to record it in your, in your local computer device. But yeah, you have yeah, this is gonna be a huge file. So my question is, if I just click on the recording button right now, that stops it? Uh, that should be one to stop the recording on your side. Huh. Who's the host? Well, right now it's listing that I'm a host and well, who, who uh, co-host. I'm a co-host. A regent. Uh, I think it's a regent. A regent. Yes, yeah. yeah, but he he made me a co-host and he sent me a message and said that we have to end recording. And uh, well, you know, you, you know the recording function probably is on the real hosts. A screen, but if you if everyone is is leaving you now, uh, it will automatically uh, have a copy for the for the whole meeting. This is a long meeting. I think the file is going to be so big. It takes yes. you know, one hour yeah. to to keep the file yeah. stored, uh, stored on your computer. Yeah, there's no way this would fit on my computer. I'm I'm working on an iPad right now. I'm just looking for where where you could end meeting here. You probably just so, leave. If you end the meeting, are you losing the recording? Right. I don't want to lose that recording. So do I go record to the cloud? It will automatically record it in the cloud. It okay. But it based on how the account owner set up a recording uh, on a cloud or local computer. But if you are not a real account owner, Nothing you can do that. Well, it says right here that the host is a regent and Greg Cunyon is the co-host. Co-host, right. <clears throat> well, uh, let's see here. Oh uh, boy, oh boy. Chat with rename on mute. Well, the video looks like it's going. Just let it go. You know, everyone leave, and I believe uh, on the screen, he will be still there. Uh, probably is, is going to record it until he terminates the, the whole meeting. Maybe he he woke up. <laughs> he wake up and he will come back to the to the computer. Yes. Well, the one thing he said he wrote here. Let me see if I can find it. He said, "Click." Click end meeting, Zoom will convert the recording into video. End meeting. We can't find end meeting. Well, yeah, I'm not seeing it. Have you, have you looked at the bottom bar and seen you gotta it? Put your, you got to put your, your, your cursor down there and it'll all come yeah. alive. I see right. record, record on this computer. Holy shit, no. 
Oh, no. You'll record it because I think, I think if you I think if you just click the leave button, then it leads you to end meeting. If you're the co-host or or the host. Oh, is that right? If, okay, if I yeah, you know, if I do it, I just leave the. You'll meeting. just leave. Okay, I'm going to hit leave right but now. You gives me an option. Yeah, you would end the meeting because I I host a lot of meetings. I know how it works. I'm yeah. an own yeah. account, so I know how to turn off the recording button, how to turn turn off the whole meeting. But if you are here, you are you are a guest, you could not do anything for that. You just leave the meeting and right. that the real host, the real account owner to handle everything else. Okay. So you're yeah, saying right a guest call by everyone. Co-host. Co-host. Okay. See you next Scott time. Scott's okay. the co-host. Aloha. I mean, Greg, so what are you doing, Greg? What are we going to do? Well, I think gonna, about... all I can do, the only option left is going to be leave. And I'm, I'm hoping well, I'm gonna that... Le I'm going to leave a message for Arija that we're not... Arija, we, don't know how to we don't know how to stop the recording. That's what I'm going to leave oh. him. We're going to leave the computer on. How, how do you... You know, we got to... We have to... Uh, see, there, there's a picture of him there. So... Uh, what would you do, uh, Jin Ying? Would just you, leave you, the meeting. Should I text him? Just leave the meeting because uh, ha -ho, who is Ha Ho? I don't know. Ha Ho or Ha Ta? Ha Ho? Is that Dr. Arijit? Hold on. It's not, he's not a doctor. He's a businessman. It's okay. Yeah, Arijit is bad. the actual. Mike, we're trying to host. figure out how to shut it down. And I'm listed as a co-host, but. I don't think it gives me the option to actually physically end the recording. I think a regent will have to come back. We all leave. A regent will come back, and then it will it will it'll do it. Okay, now it, wait a minute. I'm sending him a message. A okay. <laughs> Go Let ahead. Him speak, know that we don't what are we doing? Let him know what we're doing, Greg. Let, let him know that the only options we have available are for all of us to leave. We don't have an end meeting option here on a, on my end. Even though I'm listed as a co-host, there is no there's no option for that. It's the just like no like option for end meeting. We cannot find any option for end meeting. Right. So it it, it just has the option for me to just leave, just like it has the option for all of you. Trust me, because I have recorded a lot of meetings like these. I'm yeah. an account owner, so I know exactly how to set it up. And how to keep a, you uh, have to end the meeting. Uh, we'll be on you my don't want to the video. There's once in a uh, lifetime. So what do you do is just you just leave the meeting and I be yeah. we host the screen, the recording will be still on until the time he terminates the whole recording is being left on okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm sounds good. It's a long time. I, I haven't, and I believe everyone did not get the lunch. I'm going to have my food. <laughs> I understand. Okay, All take right. care. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye, bye. bye, Jack. I'm going to leave now. Bye. I have to go back to San Francisco. Love you, man. Are you See at ya. the farm? Are you, are, you at the, are you at the lake? Yeah, yeah. You're at the lake. This was amazing, Greg. Oh, no, this is interesting. Okay, I tell you, go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna want to move. I, what's happening with the chocolate company is gonna. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Should have been We'll talk about that. Yeah, really fucking. Sure. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. You know what? Go. I'm gonna slap you. We're gonna do okay. it. Okay. okay, bye. Bye. It doesn't have pause.